I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the August 24th, 2022 regular session of the Shirts Planning and Zoning Commission. It, it's, I, I hear it coming out of the speakers, folks. I, uh. All right, quiet, quiet, please. I'll speak as loud as I can, but if I yell too loud, all right? But you all need to be quiet if you expect to be able to hear me. All right, call the meeting to order. Item number two was seat and alternate. We have our, our brand new uh, Mr. Carbon joining us this evening. All right, hearing of residents. Okay. All right, hearing of residents, um, um, this time is set aside for any person who wishes to address the Planning and Zoning Commission. Each person shall fill out the speaker's register prior to the meeting. Presentation should be limited to no more than three minutes. Discussion by commission of any item not on the agenda shall be limited to statements of specific factual information given in response to any inquiry, a recitation of existing policy in response to an inquiry, and or a proposal to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer during the hearing of residents portion of the agenda will call on those persons who have signed up to speak in the order they have registered. All right. This time is set aside, and those of you that signed up, is signing up on this sheet is not required for the public hearing on the PDD for Northcliffe, okay? That's, that's a public hearing and it's an open forum and you weren't required to sign up. Now, those of you who did, if you choose, may speak now during the hearing of residents or you can wait and speak during the public hearing after the presentation, or you can do both, okay? Three minutes, sir, that's it, okay? No, sir, no, the, the, this meeting is not a two-way meeting right now, okay? Here's the way it's gonna work. I'm gonna call your name. If you wanna come up and speak, step up to the dais, Give your name and address for the record, and have your and, and, and you'll have three. No, sir. I don't want to waste your time. You will not. Your three minutes. You can have three minutes now, and three minutes in the public hearing. But you don't get six if you don't speak now. Does that answer your question? No, Dan. Okay. All right, folks. I don't plan on spending all night here, okay? So, no, they can't. If they want to speak, they're welcome to. They're not, they, I'm not going to allow them to give their time to you, okay? Patrick McMaster. Good evening, gentlemen. I used to be a member of a zoning hearing board in another state. I used to be a member of a zoning hearing board in another state, so I'm familiar with how this works. Um, they're requesting a planned development district in the Northcliffe area. Planned development um, is not what they're actually requesting. They're actually requesting a uh, townhome district. All the land around this district is zoned R6. So one would assume that since the golf course has gone defunct, the land should go to R6. That would be a logical assumption. 220 rent rentals will cause overcrowding in the area, which will be detrimental to health, safety, and welfare of the surrounding residents. Your criteria for improvement, 21.4- .5.4D, accordance with comprehensive land plan, I contend it's not, 
Health and welfare, I contend it's not. Appropriate for the immediate area, I contend it's not. In accordance with existing or proposed plans for schools, streets, water, sewers, and other public services, I contend it's not because the schools in that area are already overcrowded. 21.4.6, again, health and safety, consistent with other policies of the comprehensive land plan. If you grant them a variance, 21.4.12, you can't grant self-created or solely economic gain or loss variances. They created this by buying this property. It's not inherent to the property. They could develop it in other ways. Um, regs and districts, 21.5.1, it should be in accordance with the comprehensive land and promoting public health and safety. I again contend it's not. 21.5.4.3, you can recommend approval, approval with conditions or deny. I'm requesting you deny our um, Denial of basically the R4 for their plan development district. 21.5.5E is the R4 minimum lot size. I'm not sure whether the lot size is 18, um, 11, 8 or not, but I ask that you look at that because it's 10,000 for each three and 1,800 for each additional. Max density of 24 per acre. I don't think they meet that, I think they exceed it. Should not be located in areas where they increase traffic through residential areas. The only way to get to 35 South is to go through Northcliff from this area. Already they have other developments that have to drive through Northcliff to get to 1103 to go 35 South. So again, that should be a problem. Currently a golf course, they're asking for a planned development district. I think they should be asking for what they're requesting, which is a um, TH, townhome district. They're, they're not, they're asking for planned development and asking you to use the basis for R4. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Chair, if I may, if I could remind folks, if I could get you to please list your address. So if you wouldn't mind going up, buying the time, list your address. We really need that for the minutes. Sorry about that. That was Patrick McMaster, 3604 Elm Court, Shirts, Texas. Thank you, Mr. McMaster. Uh, Fred Kuntz, is it Kuntz or Kurtz? Kuntz? It's Fred Kuntz, uh, address is 3833. Green Ridge, uh, Miss Scenic Hills resident, and uh, okay, I'm a Scenic Hills resident, and uh, my one concern is the uh, green space uh, that's you know up against the back of our Scenic Hills community, and uh, I don't know if there's a proper fence there or should it be. Uh, secure enough in order for those walking trails and that's with all those how all those homes being built we're concerned about traffic along that walkway path and we're concerned uh, about security for scenic hills thank you yes sir uh margaret mendez No, ma'am. You sure you, you sure you don't want to talk? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I, I read Maggie, but I, I can't quite make out the last name. I G E L. Hi, I'm Maggie Eigel, 3712 Hunters Glen, Shirts, Texas, and I am also a Scenic Hills resident. And my concerns are a couple things. First of all, security, because again, of that open side of our development that faces the golf course. Um, if the city can work, I mean, we can't stop development. We prefer single family homes, the R6. My second preference would be if you were going to do rentals or apartments, 
to 55 plus. We have a, we have a single family home right next. Why wouldn't you do a 55 plus apartments if you're gonna wanna develop it in apartments that would coincide right next to our community that has been a good community, I believe, for the city of Schertz for over 40 years, 35 plus years. Do your research. But I think we are a good community there. And we ask, our main concern is security. There's a lot of single women like me who are widows, and opening that up to something like this look and look out for us people in our security and give us the variances so we can have a proper fence to separate us. All right, thank you. Um, looks like Joanne Wells on Wimbledon. Where were you, ma'am? Did, did, did you want to speak? Okay. Joanne Wells, 3409 Wimbledon Drive, Schertz, Texas. One of the delightful things about the golf course was that it um, served as a flood, a flood plain. Uh, I have not read up or found in, in reading how the golf course, the center of the golf course where these houses, apartments ostensibly are to be built, how they, how they will uh, sustain the kind of water that comes down uh, water flows, as I'm sure you know, from uh, east to west. Water usually in the state of Texas flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. In the case of our golf course, if we get rain, which we will get, get again, I remember in the 50s when Medina Lake was dry and it is now filled with water. God only knows how long that will last. But I have a question about uh, flood control on the, on the golf course where these houses or apartments are to be built. Is um, poking around the golf course as I have since I've lived here since um, 1977 there is a ditch that is just from reckoning, it looks like it's 20 foot deep. Uh, and from time to time, that has and probably will again be filled with water. Can you tell me? Uh, I understand it. If you go online, you can find information on the floodplain. But is this area where these houses? these apartments are to be built, are they susceptible to flooding? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Richard Maus, Maus. Richard Moss, 3434 Wimbledon Drive, Shirts, Texas. Originally, I moved here about 31 years ago to the golf course. It was a nice single family subdivision and they kept on adding subdivisions out there. At the time we started, there was only a couple. And everything was going fine until they changed the frontage road out in front of North Cliff. When they changed the frontage road, all of a sudden, the main entrance, the main exit to North Cliff wasn't used anymore. That caused a huge problem with the people in the back and that now all of a sudden the police were there putting up signs all over the place for speed limits, putting in speed bumps, putting in stop signs, and now the two minute uh, drive took eight. Now if you go at the time of school, it takes 10. 
So adding another six or 700 cars to this obviously is gonna just create a much, much bigger problem. And just kind of a little uh, background for people that don't, haven't been around the golf course very much. Uh, the other thing that happened 15 years ago was the golf course in Olympic Hills uh, went bankrupt. And they were bought by Universal City. They put $2 million into that. At the same time, two years later, the one in New Braunfels put $2 million into theirs. The city of New Braunfels did. Well, obviously, the uh, one in Northcliffe had two options, either be bought or, as what they did, they just kind of disintegrated because of, of neglect. The city looked at that several times and decided it wasn't worth the effort. So I understand we can't go back and we need to turn go forward. And I understand that the city wants to, wants revenue off of this unused property. And they also want to provide an enhanced and enjoyable place for residents to live. I attended the Sunday meeting and the developer's representative made it very clear he had no interest in the community and clearly stated that when he said that the property could not make any money by putting in single family homes on the property. The only way the company he represented could make money was to put in high density housing. To me, the only thing he tried to do was put lipstick on a pig. What he was proposing was the same as the book Animal Farm. The pigs got together and told everyone that we were all equal, just some were more equal than others. When that didn't work, they brought in the German Shepherds. The developer's representative also stated several times that they own the property. Much like the city should feel sorry for or have an obligation to bend to their will because they owned it. If he had any actual interest in the community, he would have came out and talked to the community before starting. I think the city should know the same approach that they used about the golf course and telling them they were a private business and if they went bankrupt, they went bankrupt. They should tell these developers that the community does not want this. On the website today, they said there were 73 responses from homeowners. 71 were against it, one was for it, and one was neutral. Obviously, the community is not getting any benefit from any of this. And also, the mayor talked about um, having diversity of Thank you. Now, how close are you, sir? I have a conclusion. All right, go right ahead. I understand we have to move forward. And I, I believe this community suffered a great feeling of loss when the golf course closed. I think if the planning department and council have any regard for the actual longtime residents in the area and want to attract new residents, they will rezone this to single family residential, conforming with the longstanding community standards and not, not inflict any further hardship to it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Judy Spencer. I'm Judy Spencer. I live in Phoenix. I'm, in, I'm at 3628 Elm Court in Scenic Hills. Uh, I'm a widow. I feel very comfortable in Scenic Hills now, but I don't see that same comfort being available if you have put four, four families in 50, 55 uh, houses. Um, I'm also concerned about traffic because I don't think anything will be done about streets until after the, um, uh, thank you, that's all I had. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, George Maher. Good evening. I'm George Mara. I'm at, I live at 3721 Hunter's Glen in Church, Texas. My wife and I have been residents here for a little over 18 years. We are strongly opposed to the proposed uh, zoning regarding our area. Also somewhat disappointed 
in the sense that we were not given an opportunity to get on board with this at the very beginning. Seems like we're coming into it now at the, at the tail end. I would have preferred to be able to have some inputs much earlier. When we look at the villas at Blue Bonnet Ridge, this is a multi-family housing project as opposed to single family housing. And what we're doing is really dropping a multi-family housing project right in on top of an area that has traditionally been single family homes. There's a big difference between the two. And my experience in the past has been in the management of both types of housing. I can tell you that when you deal with multi-family housing and single family housing, we're looking at two different peoples. With multifamily housing, the tenant is usually there a short period of time. They have no real stake in that property. And it's often because they really don't have a stake in the property, they even forgive their, forego their security deposit when they leave the premises. On the other hand, we as homeowners have a real stake in our properties. We have equity. We're concerned about maintaining the property, in fact, really improving the property as we've seen here in Scenic Hills. So, to further talk about multifamily housing, the issues with that are increased density, which usually means more people per square foot, more traffic, which is a major issue that most people here are concerned about, and of course, the issues of crime. Now what happens with a development like this, maintenance comes into play. Initially, the uh, building looks quite nice, but they don't stay like that. There's maintenance issues come into play later on, and pretty soon components fail within that particular property. And if the rents are not maintained at the levels that were indicated on, in the meeting on Sunday, and that they, they made no guarantee that they would hold, we could have probably expect to see those rents come down. Rents come down, it attracts a lower income tenant, and crime tends to increase, and also noise and many factors that we would not be comfortable with. So to, to us, the solution is R6, zone as single family housing. When you do that, you protect our property values, you decrease crime that may result from multifamily housing, and a host of other things that are problems like traffic, crime, noise, etc. So to us, the, the solution to this thing is to rezone single family housing, which we think would be in the best interest of ever, everyone. And I think really the city of Shirts as well, because I think it puts a strain on the city as well in terms of infrastructure requirements, police, fire, public works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Robin Streff. Hello, I'm Robin Streff. My address is 3624 Chestnut Court, Shirts 78108. I'm also a member of the Scenic Hills community and I've lived there six years. Um, there are a couple points that I'd like to reiterate, and you've probably heard them before in the former speeches. This proposed zoning change will change the total character of the neighborhood, leading to more people, more traffic, safety issues, noise, and a reduction in property values. This is a case of spot zoning. Properties surrounding this proposed rezoning is zoned single family. The proposed development is not in harmony with the existing properties. Adding density to established neighborhoods draws mixed use developments away from neighborhoods that are in need of investment. When you're looking at the single family homes in our community and people are looking to buy single family homes, I don't know of anyone who is looking for single family homes that says on their wish list, I would like to be located next to an apartment complex. 
<laughs> Homeowners and people who rent single family homes do not want a multi-unit apartment complex next to their homes. Adding zoning density to the residential neighborhoods encourage absentee owners to replace own homeowners, which destabilizes the neighborhood. The only positive I can see out of rezoning is that it makes the zoning people feel good, but the homeowners feel bad. Um, those of you that are in the doorway there, I apologize for the lack of seating. There is some space up here along this side if you'd like like to come in the on oh, and there's apparently there are a couple of seats sprinkled through the audience. Um, is this uh house in Lao? Good evening. My name is Hongsen Lau. I live at 3678 Pebble Beach, Shirts. And um, I'm not going to go rehash a lot of what has already been said. I agree with it. My biggest concern is whether or not an environmental, some sort of environmental impact statement has been performed in order for us to be more informed about what the potential effects of such a development would be you know, on infrastructure, as I was pointing out, on traffic, et cetera. So that, that would be my major concern. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> Brad Weberg. Yes, sir. Um, Lori Lampier, Lampier? I'm reading it right. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm probably the new kid on the block because I've lived in this community for a year. Lori Lampier, 3731 Columbia Drive. Thank you. 78108. Um, one of the things that I love about this community is everybody there wants to help each other. There's such community. Everybody is focused on their properties, their land. Everybody there is a community. And I believe when you get in rental units, and everybody deserves a, affordable housing, don't get me wrong, but you're dropping it into an area that's in existence that has values currently in the area that I don't believe, from what I understand, any feasibility study has been done to determine what impact that would have on our community. So if you have not looked at the housing values and what they will be using this, what they're calling fourplex, which is really glorified apartments, um, and looked at what it'll have impact on roads, on schools, on community, and investment in the community. We've all invested in the community. The people in apartments, I lived in apartments, you know, before I could afford houses. We don't care. We just go there, we go to sleep, we eat, and we go to work. And we know we're just, our goal is to get out and get a house. And I don't see any investment that is positive for our community and the people who are in existence and who are committed to our community. So I would ask you all to look at that before you make any decision otherwise. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, it looks like uh, Jorge Rodriguez Solis. My name is Jorge Rodriguez. I live at 3334 Fox Fire Lane. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah? All right. So 
I'll start off by saying that uh, according to the North Cliff guidelines, right, according to their website and what they have, I see this whole thing as a sign of disrespect to every single community member. Uh, reasons for it is uh, according to the documents I have within 30 days of proposed plan to make a decision. As far as notifying the residents, I believe we're all affected whether they put the wall right next to it or not, we're all affected. Uh, a certain portion of the residents were actually notified, not everyone. And uh, I encourage every single one of you to go ahead and read the second to last page, which is 527 and 729, where it says the amendment of the above deed restrictions. But that's something you could read. In the meantime, I'd like to start off with myself. I came into this country at eight years old, very impoverished community. Um, my mother could only afford rent at $200 a month, right? My mother could only afford rent roughly $200 a month. I can't say that every single person that lives in Section 8 is the same story, but I will tell you that just about every single one of them, quite frankly, didn't care. It was the values and attributes that my mother put in me to work hard and strive in life to get to where I am today. I can't tell you how hard it's been for myself, for my wife, and my kids to be to where we're at today. I will tell you a little story of Montgomery County, which is a predominant neighborhood in Maryland, probably one of the most predominant neighborhoods in Gaithersburg, where we lived. It is pretty much what you're trying to do with our community, right? Quadruplex, aplexes, whatever you want to call it, they used to have owners that, that rented them. Unfortunately, by the time we got there, it was maybe one or just a, in our aplex, there was one owner. And he couldn't brag about telling me how good the old days were as far as when people used to own those, those uh, plexes and once they started rent, uh, renting them, how far they went down. The point being is roughly 50% of my neighbors, I even saw it increase as I left from when I first arrived were all Section 8, right? People didn't find spots or places to find their cars, I mean to park their cars, so they had to park them two, three streets away. So what is it that you're trying to do to our community? I ask you to look at every single person that's sitting right here. If you ask me, you're attacking a very vulnerable community, right? We're not talking about 30, 40 year old people. You know, we're talking about an elderly community, right? Well-established neighborhood and you're bullying them, literally. By building this establishment, <laughs> right? You're building this, this new plants right next to them. Literally, you're bullies, that's all you are, right? And I will make sure that I volunteer my extra time and effort to make sure that if this plan goes through, you don't get elected again. I, I couldn't even hear what she said, so. Mine's, I'm running a timer, ma'am, to back, to back up our clerk over here. That's all I'm doing, okay? All right, that's, that's enough. That, that's enough. And I don't appreciate the threats, Mr. Rodriguez. And, 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 and just so you know, we're, we're, That's a comment for city council, sir. We're appointed, we're not elected, okay? John Lowry. Good evening, lady and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Towery, uh, Scenic Hills resident, 3825 Green Ridge in shirts. Um, I'm uh, vehemently opposed to the uh, many of the aspects of this project. 
I think there are a few obvious assumptions that we all ag uh, will agree on here. We understand it will never, that, that this land that is currently vacant and is under consideration will never be a golf course. We all realize that, that fact. Uh, and that it will be residential in some, some way, shape, or form. Our principal and my principal objection to this is that it is uh, multifamily housing, or uh, it will eventually become that uh, which is uh, zone R4. Uh, with surrounding communities all zoned R6, single family uh, housing, single family dwellings. Uh, it's inconsistent with the surrounding community, and I think uh, it would be more palatable to the surrounding residents in the in the greater North Clift area if uh, it were uh, to be to proceed towards that direction of single family homes. Uh, having a majority of rental property, uh, as as many as 220 rental units there inside uh, surrounding communities that are all uh, homeowners is just uh, totally inconsistent. Um, so, and, and then my, my last serious concern is uh, the uh, plan that the Parks uh, and Rec Department put in. I know that's a council issue, but it involves uh, this project as well, is the, the plan to put through a park through the utility easement, uh, which seriously jeopardizes the security of the scenic hills neighborhood. So uh, again, I voiced my opposition to uh, the plan as, as it was put forward. I think possibly with some modifications and changes to it to uh, that the surrounding communities would be more acceptable to what we know that eventually will we'll be going in. Thank you again for your time. And I apologize, Mr. Towery. It's sometimes with all the writing, it's hard to see what the. So, um, the next one, it, it's Wagner is the last name. Um, Otham, Othman. Okay, Warner. All right, thank you. My name is Othan Warner, 3717 Hunters Glen, Church, Texas. Um, this project is in my back door. Uh, let's talk about the white elephant in the room, money. Okay, I understand the developer owns the land and has the right to develop it. That's his right. He wants 55 units that they plan to sell at $700,000 per quad, $38.5 million. He could sell 110 single family homes for $350,000 and get the same money. Maybe not quite the same profit. I understand this is his dream. This is the max profit for the least amount of work and effort is to put these quads in there. The 110 homes would be half the density, more than half the cars probably, and a lot of your problems would go away. <laughs> <laughs> so we're asking that you uh, entertain rezoning at the uh, R6, which is the same thing both neighborhoods are on either side of this project. The city is responsible for its citizens' safety. As has been said before, that's kind of gone out the window. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone, council and appointees, your allegiance should be with the citizens, not with the developer. <laughs> Let's see, Gregory Siebold.
Good evening. My name is Gregory Siebold. I reside at 3713 Hillside in Church, Texas. I have essentially seven different areas that I want to point out to you that, that conflict with your own unified development code, as stated in section 21.1.2. The UDC, I'll abbreviate it for time, is to protect, promote, improve, and provide for the public health, safety, and general welfare of the citizens of the city. That includes everybody that's in this room probably. Ensure the safe, orderly, and efficient development and expansion of the city in accordance with and pursuant to the comprehensive land plan and master thoroughfare plan. Now I know you all probably know this, so I'm reading it mostly for, for others and for the minutes so that you know that I know it. Prevent the overcrowding of land and avoid undue concentration or diffusion of population. Protect and conserve the value of the land throughout the city and the value of the buildings and improvements upon the land that is incumbent upon your commission. And to minimize the conflicts among the uses of land and buildings. Minimize pollution of air and water. Assure the adequacy of drainage facilities. Safeguard water resources. Lessen congestion in the streets and provide convenient, safe, and efficient circulation for vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Facilitate the adequate and efficient provision of transportation, water, wastewater, schools, and public safety. There's time, I won't read all of it. First of all, the design is not consistent with this development code. Second of all, safety. As defined in Texas, under law, elder abuse is defined as includes involuntary seclusion or intimidation. And that's what you've heard prior to me tonight. People feel like they're being intimidated, they're being bullied, and this this project potentially challenges their safety. The watershed flood control, it says you have to assure adequate drainage facilities, but in 2007, the city forced Scenic Hills to accept the drainage from the next community into ours, saying that the city would maintain it. However, they didn't. In May of this year, we had to spend $250,000 to maintain that because you put too much water in it. I'm not saying you specifically, I'm saying the city that adopted it back then. Schools, the schools are already overcrowded. Nobody can adequately or even intelligently deny that. Schools are overcrowded. What are you gonna do? You have 220 units proposed. That's a possibility. If you take just the average number of one person, which it isn't, that's 220 school children added to a system that's already overcrowded. You have, it's the whole document, the whole plan for this community as stated in the city is that it's for a single family residence. This is not a single family residence, this is a multifamily. Hence that's why they're asking for R4 versus R6. We would believe that R6 would be more congruent with what is needed. The property and values. Mr. Seawall, I need to ask I'll, you to wrap it up. End it with this. Okay. Thank you. The property values, as stated prior, I realize it's it's tax money. But as our property values decline, so does the city's taxes. Thank you. Richard Perry. I'm Richard Perry, 3913 Pecan Court, Church, Texas. Uh, I bought my house uh, about 11 years ago. It looked out onto the 10th green, uh, 11th tee box. It was beautiful. We knew when the golf course closed, we all knew that this day was coming. The only thing we didn't know is that we were going to be stuck with apartments, rental apartments. Uh, I don't think anybody in existence wants rental apartments in a subdivision that was built for a single 
uh, houses. If you look at the overall layout, there's probably seven or eight subdivisions around that old golf course. And I think this is a test case. I think if this goes through, you're gonna see apartments in every aspect of that golf course. You've got a chance to stop it now because all, all of your problems are gonna quadruple and go on up. So please keep it as an R6 single housing development. I know the contractor has plan B. If he doesn't, he wouldn't have bought that acreage. His plan A was to get all the money he could out of the multiplex places. Uh, plan B, I'm sure is for him, is single, part, single homes. I suggest you tell him, show us what you've got for plan B. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Jason Hibbard. Jason Hibbard, assuming I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, 6025 Scenic Link. Not here? No, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to him then. Um, Samantha Goggins. Hi, my name is Samantha Goggins. I live at 3401 Foxbriar Lane. 3401 Foxbriar Lane. Um, I've been in that location for about 12 years, but I've been a resident of Shirts since 1997. Seen a lot of growth, a lot of things change. Um, I, the reason this concerns me is one, there's obviously a huge side of the golf course. We already know everything up on the access road is gonna be developed. That's gonna be a terrible increase in traffic. That will be a terrible increase in traffic when that happens as is, but within the interior of the neighborhood, um, there's not a lot of ways to get around, right? So the school districts are busting, the bus schedule can't handle my kids in the neighborhood. The elementary school that this would feed into is one of the largest in the city, it's busting at the seams. The intermediate school that this would feed into is equally large and two charter schools have been put in next to both of those. I think there's somebody on the docket here trying to get rezoning for some of that, hopefully to help with the parking situation, but the traffic in this area is terrible and it cannot be supported by the schools, the roads. Throughout this whole area, the pipes are always busting. We're always having problems with water throughout the entire area. I really ask that you keep this as R6. What you do on one side of the golf course, it's probably gonna happen on the other side, and that is a huge increase of density, high volume traffic through an area that's supposed to be 30 to 20 miles per hour the entire way through. So I really ask that you think forward, right? I am guilty of kind of talking trash about Cibolo because the roads are terrible, they're planning, the way they structured it didn't work out. Schertz has historically been great at having foresight, looking to the future and making sure that it's going to work. And I just ask that you really look at this because this area cannot handle this density. Um, there are probably other areas in Schertz where it might be a little bit easier to make this happen. I really ask that you look at these situations because as a parent, it makes my life more difficult, but it's not even just our neighborhood, right? There's te teachers all over Schertz who come into this area, have to deal with this. Um, I think they were saying these are gonna be marketed towards the military, gosh. That traffic to get to, Air Force, to the military Air Force Base, it's gonna be a nightmare, guys. I really ask that you reconsider this, do R6 so that we can continue living our lives. Um, I'm happy with the trails that are gonna go under the power lines. I know that that's been a plan throughout all of Shirts. I'm okay with that because as we lose more green space, it's gonna be very important that we keep that. Um, all these neighborhoods have gone up, they're private pools, they're private parks, right? This, the shirts pool in the neighborhood can't even be operating right now. It was supposed to be a splash pad. Nothing has happened. So there's, this area has been neglected as part of the annexation and I really ask that you just look at another area to do this. Thank you. Thank you. 
Betsy Berg. My name is Betsy Berg, and I live at 4013 Cypress Court in Scenic Hills. Um, my property abuts the, the uh, tract uh, and the 100-foot electrical easement. And I'm on, my house is only eight feet from the property line of the track being considered. That is also being considered for a park. Um, there's a utility easement of 16 feet that serves scenic hills. It has our um, telephone lines, our electrical lines, the cable lines, and, and whatever else. And this 16-foot easement is also part of the 100-foot easement. I believe that the developer should build an 8-foot fence separating the easement from the parkland, our easement from the parkland. Uh, he's building a wall on the other side, but he's not building a wall on our side. We're a senior citizen community. We're more vulnerable to criminal trespass without a wall to protect us. Um, there are also two drainage easements as well as the utility easements in that same area. And these two drainage easements extend from the streets in Scenic Hills out into what we used to call the Green Belt. And neither of these things were something I saw on the master plan that was presented, you know, Sunday. So I wanted to bring y'all's attention to all of these easements that are in that to perhaps to be parkland. Um, I've spoken informally to Mr. Benson, and he is amenable to discussing this possibility. Um, but that's all I have. To, okay, I believe, but I too believe that the track should be zoned as R6 rather than R4 to be compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next uh, I have Steve and Teresa Smart. You can either both come up or you can each have three minutes, however you want to work it. Hello, Steve Smart 6086 covers Cove. And I'm probably going to repeat some of the things that have been said before, but uh, we are opposed to the villas. Uh, project that's being planned and we've been here for 14 plus years we've enjoyed the neighborhood like it is the golf course when it was there and now the space that's there we understand something is going to be built but we just don't want this type of multifamily situation to be built there the the property values are going to go down in our opinion and what's going to happen is we feel like there's going to be an exodus of some people who own homes, which means home rentals are going to go up, in addition to having this rental facility being established. Another thing is we're thinking about are the traffic issues. We live on Covers Cove. We've been beat up on that street for years as things have developed. They've even put speed bumps in, and those speed bumps are now tore up and either need to be replaced or something. But now you put this multifamily project in there, where's everybody gonna go? They're gonna have to go to Columbia and Country Club or they're gonna have to come down Covers Cove. So it just presents a traffic issue, a nightmare. These construction vehicles tear up the roads. The third thing is the safety and security of our community. We feel that this multifamily project that's coming in is going to affect our safety and security. More vandalisms, some looting, possibly other things. And we'd like you to consider that aspect as reasons why we oppose this project. So 
those are items we'd like for you to consider. Thank you for your time. And uh, Mr. Smart, did the other half, did Teresa want to come up and speak? All right, thank you. Um, looks like George Weekly. Sixty-one sixteen Covers Cove. No. Um, Dana, is it Giggy? I'm Dana Giggy, and I live at 3825 Overlook Drive in Shirts, and I'm a resident of Scenic Hills, and I feel like this is a, R4 is a totally inappropriate zoning for this parcel of land. I've done a little checking. You have to drive quite a few miles in any direction from our homes to find any multifamily uh, apartments or anything like that. We need a lot of work in our area. Uh, Country Club Boulevard is just a nightmare to drive on. I guess if you're a little kid, you think it's a roller coaster and it's like, wow. They were nice enough. We had a bump that would practically knock your car out. They put a little sign up and it says bump ahead. So we, we do appreciate that. But that is the main road in and out. It's not really good enough to handle the traffic that we have now. As has been stated before, if you want to go south on 35, you have to go through North Cliff and wind around their streets to get to 1103. The only other option is to take 35 north to Schwab Road and turn around and come back, and who wants to do that? So how many more people are gonna be driving through that neighborhood? We also have the security issue. When the golf course was there, the people whose houses backed up to it weren't really too concerned about it because the only thing was the houses clear on the other side of the golf course, and they're very similar to ours in, except for the fact that they're not 55 plus. So they're concerned about having, you know, five, 600 residents in that small area and then the pathway that they proposed that the Parks Department asked to have put in, those people are gonna be riding their bikes, walking, whatever, skateboarding, within eight feet of their patio doors. And that was, that's concerning to them. So I just wanted to say that with all the other issues that they're there, I think this should be zoned as, as, as an R6 for single family homes because that's what is there now. That's what the infrastructure can handle, and that will maintain the integrity of our neighborhood and all the other neighborhoods surrounding the golf course. We do understand the golf course is not coming back. We also understand that there's gonna be development of the golf course. We just think it should be appropriate to fit in with the rest of the neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisa Kelly. Um, Douglas Young. Um, now this one is crossed off. Uh, Pedro and Sally Macros or Marcos, did you? Not want to speak now? Okay. All right, so let me go back. Um, Jason Hibbard, is, is he here? No. And then George Weekly? No, okay. All right. Item number four on the agenda is our consent agenda as a single item. The minutes for the June 22nd, 2022 regular meeting. At the public hearing, ma'am. Yeah, what happens 
is right now we're, uh, the public hearing is agenda item number 5A. That's the next one up. And okay? And I and I'll exp I'll explain a little bit more when we come to that. Okay. So, commissioners, uh, do we need to pull this for discussion? If not, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Broad. Do I have a second? A second. And it was yeah. uh, <clears throat> Hector, right? Okay. Uh, all right, so I have a, a, mo a motion to approve and a second. Uh, there's no discussion on the consent agenda. I'll call for the vote. Aye. 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 All right, six ayes, none opposed. That motion passes. Okay. Public hearing, item number five. The Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing related to zone change requests and replats within the agenda. The public hearing will be open to receive a report from staff, the applicant, the adjoining property owners affected by the applicant's request, and any other interested persons Upon completion, the public hearing will be closed. The commission will discuss and consider the application and may request additional information from staff or the applicant if required. After deliberation, the commission is asked to consider and act upon the following requests and make a recommendation to city council if necessary. Item 5A, PLPDD 2022-0095, a request to rezone approximately 25 acres of land from pre-development district to planned development district, generally located approximately 2,200 feet southeast of the intersection of Country Club Boulevard and IH-35 Access Road, also known as a portion of Kamau County Property Identification Number 377261 and Guadalupe County Property Identification Number 63833. City of Shirts, Kamau County, and Guadalupe County, Texas. Uh, Mr. James, give me just a minute here. So what we're gonna do, is we're going to start with a presentation from staff. Uh, once staff is finished with their presentation, uh, the developer, if uh, do, do you know, Mr. James, do they want to speak this evening? I think they do want to speak. Okay, yeah. and, th and then we'll hear a presentation from the developer. And after those two are done, we, I will then open the floor uh, for anyone interested in speaking on this topic. Okay? All right, Mr. James, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Brian James, Assistant City Manager for the City of Shirts. Um, I, was, I was hoping you guys would tell me if you couldn't hear me, and y'all did, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. That's probably not going to be the last time tonight you have to tell me you can't hear me or to speak into the mic. Uh, good news is your tax dollars are going to be hard at work. In November, assuming everything comes in, we're redoing the video and, and audio system uh, to hopefully help this so we're not having to, to really swallow the mic going forward. So I appreciate your patience. Um, but just to, to, to remind everybody, again, everybody knows I think who's been here that what we're considering is a rezoning application for the approximately 25 acre tract of land, uh, generally kind of between Country Club, Covers Cove, uh, between the, the two neighborhoods there in, in Northcliff. Um, but before I get into that, let me kind of maybe take some time, as Commissioner Outlaw did a little bit, to, to just walk through kind of the process, things like that. Uh, some folks I, I recognize from council meetings and PNZ meetings in the past, other folks uh, probably, probably first time here. Um, so the, the way the process is supposed to work uh, in, in terms of ultimately what happens here is ultimately this zoning case will go to city council and city council is the final approval authority on it. Staff makes a recommendation. Uh, we do that for the Planning and Zoning Commission. We, we do that for city council as well. The Planning and Zoning Commission will make a recommendation to city council. And, and just to kind of cover this, they've got a few options essentially. They can recommend approval of it as the applicants proposed it. They can recommend approval of it with changes. They can recommend denial of it. And, and, and they also have the ability to, to essentially table it to say, we need more information, we need to think about it, we wanna come back at this at a future meeting. But those are generally the options that they've got. Um, 
If they were to act on it tonight, tentatively the item is scheduled to go to City Council on September 27th. And I would certainly encourage folks, regardless of the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission, to attend the City Council meeting. Check the website. When we post the agenda, we'll, we'll, it'll be listed on there. And if you've seen in the city's webpage where we have information about this application, uh, we'll indicate that as well. Just be clear, the folks who got the notice will not get another notice before city council. Um, so you can certainly call up to staff, check the website, find out when it's going to be there, and, and come back and, and consider it. Um, and, and as I said, each of the different folks involved in this has a different role. Staff makes a recommendation. We tend to do that typically from a technical standpoint, from the uh, perspective of the policies and, and planning documents of the city. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, and I don't know if this was clarified uh, earlier when I, when I stepped out for a bit, but uh, the folks up here are not elected. They are citizens just like you who are volunteering their time, typically twice a month, and it's beyond twice a month because they spend a lot of time reading the packet. They don't get paid for it uh, to try to help uh, make our community better. So certainly folks out there, we'd encourage you to sign up for city boards and commissions to be part of that process. Uh, we do need folks for that. They make a recommendation as those citizens who sit up here a couple times every month looking at development application, understanding the city's code and regulations and policies as well. And then I will say, if not certainly equally as important, if not more important, are you folks who've come out tonight, the citizens of Shirts, uh, to weigh in on, on this case. And, and so that is the way the process is supposed to work. This is designed so that you have your say to be able to stand up. And, and again, somebody earlier tonight asked how late this had gone. I think Megan said maybe 10.30 or something. I've been at a PNZ meeting that went till 3.30 a.m. Uh, one time. Uh, I was much younger then, so I was able to stay awake for it. No, no I couldn't now. Um, but that's the point of the process. The point of the process, and, and I appreciate the passion, is for you to let the commission know and let staff know because when this goes on, we, we at times reevaluate our, re our recommendation to, to let them know uh, how you feel. Again, we, we periodically say, hey, get your name and address. That's so Tiffany can get minutes done of it. Those minutes go on to council and that's part of what council gets in addition to watching the video so that they have all of that information in, in hand to, to go forward. So I know folks are frustrated but, but just as a reminder, this is how the process is supposed to work. Fortunately, in our country, you guys have a say. This is the first part where you have that say to stand up and say what you, what you want to think. And, and, and I know folks at times don't think this, but, but I will tell you, our Planning and Zoning Commission listens and they hear you. And our City Council listens and they hear you. They don't necessarily always make the decision you want. They don't always make the decision that the Planning and Zoning Commission want. They certainly don't always make the decision that, that staff recommends. Um, but again, hopefully by everybody weighing in, council makes that better decision going forward. So again, I, I appreciate your patience. I'll kind of wrap that up and get going here. Um, but, but just to say that I certainly appreciate this, I think unfortunately when we all learned that the golf course had closed, um, wasn't likely that it was going to reopen, we, we certainly understood that we were going to have to deal with this as we, as we came forward. So uh, I'll kind of start the presentation and go from there. So as we've talked about, and I think most of the residents know, uh, the property outlined in green is the property that's under consideration for the, the rezoning. Um, again, one of the things someone mentioned earlier is only the folks within 200 feet got noticed, and you're correct, per state law, per city code, we notify residents within that 200 feet. What we tend to find is what happens tonight is once those go out and some people get it, it starts to, to go out to everybody and folks find out about it. We also have the zoning notification signs. I know they're small. The intent is to catch your attention, get you to go call up and ask or check the website, find out more about the application. But again, wanted to, to indicate the map uh, for the public hearing notice. I'll also touch on this real quick because this map is, is helpful in doing that. One of the provisions that's in state law that again is in our code as well is that if the owners of 20% of the property or more within that 200 foot area surrounding the property being rezoned, in writing, 
oppose the proposed rezoning, and we have to get those in before city council, then it requires a supermajority of the city council. So again, I will tell you, because I know I was at the meeting on Sunday, we got a whole bunch turned in then, I know that planning staff has gotten a bunch turned in. From our initial estimate, the, the opposition has exceeded that up around close to 30%, and they may still be rolling in. We have 38.05%. Yeah, so again, it, it seems to go up so fairly accurate. So point being, at this point, uh, it would trigger a supermajority of city council, which is three-fourths of the members who, who vote uh, for the item going forward. So just to let folks, folks know that off the top, because this map is helpful to, to show that. Again, we certainly appreciate the, the comment cards from everybody outside that area. We typically include those in council packets, but just to be clear, for the purposes of this uh, triggering of the supermajority, it's only those folks within the 200 feet. But again, I appreciate everybody further out turning them in. We send those on to council just so they have that in writing, again, one of those mechanisms. So um, that, that explains this map. Again, this is the uh, zoning map or a copy of the zoning map for the city of Schertz. As some of the residents have clearly indicated, the property on either side to the north and south um, and, and as well as to the east is zoned R6, which is single family residential, 7,200 square foot minimum lot size. The property being rezoned, and you can see from the map that we have the property here and then this property as well, and the property up here are zoned pre. We don't have a lot of zoning of pre in the city of Schertz, but it is essentially considered a bit of a holding zoning district. Very, very, very limited, no uses, and, and generally the concept is at some point, folks come back in and they rezone that to, to something else. But again, this is why we're here tonight, I, I think we heard folks talk about this, some folks say, don't want anything to happen. Other folks said, I kind of get it, understand golf courses isn't coming back, something needs to happen. But as they've indicated, their position would be to zone it to something other than what the applicant is, is recommending. Um, and so again, that's, that's the current zoning that we've got. Um, this is a map of the City of Schertz's uh, future land use plan from our comprehensive plan. And, and the yellow is essentially single family, a single family designation. The thing I would point out though about this, because again, a lot of questions we get from folks is it says single family. This is not an application with the base district of single family. Um, so it doesn't, on, on first blush, seem uh, consistent with the city's comp plan. But, but the map is often the first thing people look to when kind of checking the city's comprehensive plan. They're, they're often kind of most aware of that. Uh, but we also have the document that back it, backs it up, the studies that come in that back it up. Um, and while, again, very few people probably have read the thing cover to cover, that text of that document is, is very, very significant in looking at the land uses. And when you look at the sector plan that we came through and did um, about seven, eight, nine years ago, one of the things that it talks about is that for these broader designations of single family, that it's not just single family detached homes, that it's intended to have a variety of housing types. So again, that may be duplexes, maybe garden homes, maybe townhomes, and, and some multifamily as well. Um, so while that's the case, just because it says that, it doesn't mean every zoning application that comes in with a single family designation, any of those uses is appropriate. That serves as a guide. You have to zone in conformance with that, but there are certainly other factors to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis within that to decide is that appropriate here or is something else? Because clearly an argument can be made, R6 would be appropriate, 7,200 square foot lots, or maybe, you know, because this is a golf course, 12,000 square foot lots is the best use of it. Or maybe, again, it's the proposal or something different or some combination in between. So again, you have to look at those factors. So just, just in terms of how we look at the city's comp plan uh, and reading the text of it. Um, one thing that, that one of the residents pointed out and I think is important, and this, this gives a good feel for it, is the property is encumbered by a number of easements uh, across it. So you can certainly see the easement that comes down through here, and I'm surprised I've not been told to speak louder 
till now, so sorry about that. Uh, we've got the really large easement, the utility easement, approximately 100 feet wide, that runs across the south side of the property and other easements up here. Um, I, will, I will only say this, that the zoning is the first step typically in the development process. So if the applicant gets approved to rezone for something, whatever that might be, R6, this application, something else, that's really the first step. The next step is to come in and plat the property and there are a series of plat applications that come in and that's where we tend to look at things like drainage and how they handle it. It's, it, it's where we look at how will they provide water and sewer to, to the property um, and it's where the applicant also tries to deal with easements, either abandoning them, relocating locating them or things like that. But certainly I think as folks have noted, uh, this large utility easement across the, the southern portion can't be relocated, it's, it's there, it's gonna stay there, and the applicant has sort of factored that into their, to their development proposal. Um, and, and so with that again, wanted to, to point out a couple of the copies of the zoning maps. We go over this a few times just to make sure folks are kind of clear on it. But again, on the left is the current zoning of pre. On the right would be the change that the applicant is proposing if this is approved and that would go to a planned development district. And so I'll use this moment to talk a little bit about what a, a planned development district is and it sounds like from the speakers a lot of folks have a pretty good understanding that but again for some folks this may be the first time and so I'll take a minute and talk about what the, what the planned development district is for. So with regard to the city's zoning map, Particularly for residential, uh, the different zoning districts, districts often uh, correspond with different lot sizes. One zoning district may require 12,000 square foot minimum lot size, another zoning district 8,400, another zoning district 7,200. Some zoning districts allow duplexes, which is essentially two units on one lot. Others allow townhomes, and again, townhomes are typically uh, buildings connected one after the other, sort of row houses that we think about, and often those are each on their own individual lots. And then they allow for multifamily, which are more units on a lot. What, what the PDD is intended for is if you have a project that doesn't fit neatly into any of those different zoning categories, it's something different, something unique, and, and rather than say, oh, it just doesn't fit with our code, the idea is it may have merit and we can tailor a district specifically to that. Um, one of the benefits of that, it, it also allows um, council to impose conditions as part of that plan development district on the zoning. So for instance, just to understand what could be done, um, one of the concerns we heard a lot of folks about here is concern about the lack of a proposed wall or fence uh, along the edge of the property. The, uh, it could be included in the plan development district that the property owner on developing this would be required to construct a six, eight foot wall, masonry wall, wrought iron, either one along generally the southern property line. Um, you know, the, the PDD allows you to do things like in terms of adjusting height, increasing landscaping, provide amenities and things like that. Um, so again, I, I certainly understand some of the folks saying we just don't like it at all, you can, you can dress this thing up all you want, we still don't like it, still not in favor of it, uh, but again, part of what I think the commission listens to and council will listen to are what were some of those particular factors given and, and maybe there's a way to mitigate those um, going forward. And so that's what the plan development district does, but essentially it's got a base zoning district uh, that goes to it. The other thing I will say and, 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 and to make clear for folks is in the plan development district ordinance, we draft the ordinance when it goes to council but some of the attachments kind of generally encompass what would be in that plan development district is if the PDD is silent on it, doesn't say anything about it, then it essentially reverts to the city's zoning ordinance and the standards located within the zoning ordinance. However, if the PDD makes reference to it and, and discusses it and sets a standard, then the standard of the plan development district would hold. The other part of the PDD is it allows you to sort of lock in what the development's gonna look like and feel like. So for example, and I'll, I'll move on here, um, is one of the things to attach as part of the plan development district 
is this layout? And so that would require the applicant, I'm gonna caveat and then I'm gonna explain, to generally the, develop the property like this. And, and so some key factors are, generally they've got the lots platted out in the pattern they do. Each lot generally has four units on it. So if this were to get approved, and, and it's not done yet by any stretch of the imagination, and may not, but if the applicant subsequently said, you know, I just wanna come back and do a typical suburban style apartment complex, three or four stories that, that we, we typically see, um, you know, like, like off Elbel, for example, the zoning would not allow them to do that. The zoning specifically says if you're gonna develop it, it's gotta develop in this fashion. Um, and so that's one of the things that, that, again, typically folks have a concern about is, yeah, they're standing up telling us this, how do we know if it's gonna happen or not? But I will tell you the flip side of that is there are things that the city does not regulate and cannot regulate. So what the price point of these units are, we, we can't regulate that. That's not something that we can do. The applicant can stand up and give you what they believe it to be, but at the end of the day, I, I can't make that, that happen um, going forward. The, the other thing I will say though, and this is where the caveat comes in as a sort of a general, but we can clarify. So one of the things that we heard, most people didn't like the idea of the trail and folks coming close to the, the homes over here. Did, did have a speaker or two who, who was more positive on that. Again, when we had some of the meetings at council and folks were uh, upset the golf course was going away, one of the things they, they said we really want to keep are some of those walking paths and things like that. So certainly, for example, and this may not change people's minds, but it could be, well, if you're going to do it, uh, we could certainly, you know, I think staff understands that uh, one thing to do would be to move the walking trail uh, further away from the, the residential homes here. And, and we could do that in a number of ways. We could set a minimum distance that that has to be away from those residential homes, 30 feet, something like that. You know, we could work to get a graphic with a better layout before council, uh, something like that. So again, some things, and where I said are general, that would be the case. And so I will tell you that with regard to the alignment of the trail, that was really just to illustrate there was a trail back there but I think certainly heard loud and clear on Sunday that if thing is, this thing is gonna happen, gonna have the trail, move it further to the north, away from the residents, um, and, and certainly reasonable. So with that, um, these are generally the dimensional standards, and again, the applicant has gone with a, a base zoning district um, for multifamily. Again, it's a little bit of a different type of product. But, but one thing I will point out is a, a couple of things. The, the maximum height proposed um, is, is 35 feet, and that's the maximum height in the adjacent zoning districts as well. Um, the other thing to make clear on this, this proposal is that the units, uh, unlike a typical apartment complex where you have a unit on the ground floor, a different unit on the second floor, if it's three stories, a different unit on the third floor, the units will all have a ground floor element to it. So again, it's more like that typical townhouse or row house with the ground floor element and then a second story on top of it, but it's, it's all the same unit as opposed to a different person living above or below somebody for what it's worth. Uh, one thing that there, there is a little bit of a discrepancy on with the, the application has to do with the number of parking spaces, whether it's 1.5, 2, 2.5. Um, I think generally what staff would recommend is that um, for the sake of clarity and, and ease of application that the requirement be three spaces per unit. It's essentially what they, they tend to kind of come out with. But one of the things that that does is going forward, if someone were convert, a bedroom to an office. We're not getting into an argument about it. it's not a bedroom, it's, it's an office. Um, it sets a standard number of units um, for it, which, which seems to be consistent with the gist, maybe a little, a little higher kind of going forward. So that's one point of clarification. Okay, I talked about the single family residential development from the comp plan language. It allows a mix of residential uses. Again, doesn't mean every residential zoning district is appropriate in every location uh, going forward. But, but with that, based on the comp plan, so another frustration, staff is recommending approval of the proposed request. So I will tell you, staff has been diligently taking notes, listening to residents, we'll certainly listen to the discussion and the residents coming up after this. 
we'll listen to the PNZ recommendation and take a look at it going forward. And as we've done in the past, that may be adjusting our recommendation, changing it, uh, adding provisions based on things that we hear. So it, it kind of moves forward. So with that, that's staff's presentation. All right, thank you, Mr. James. Do you have a presentation, Todd? You're just going to wing it. Okay. I can. And, and again, let me let me say this to real quick. Sorry, I, as the commission knows, I tend to talk a lot. Um, one of the things that certainly after this item is considered, however it goes, I'm going to step outside out front and happy to stand there with you, answer questions. Hear what you think about me. That's part of the process. So again, if, if I'd encourage you, if you have questions or want to chat, step outside out front, and I'll stay out there as long as we need to to make sure you understand what's occurring. Good evening, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, my name is Buck Benson. I am probably the most hated person in the room, right? Of course. Close for that. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Buck Benson. I represent the developer. I'm probably the most hated person in the room right now. and yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. My wife's not here, so it's, it's all good. Um, I want to thank you all for your time this evening. I want to thank staff for their presentation on this particular matter. Uh, I know it's got a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of different facets. Um, I did want to give you kind of a brief overview of the, of the project as a whole. Um, yeah. Brian, can we put or can that uh, put the site plan back up? No worries. You want it for you? I work for everybody. You want this one? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Gonna have to. Uh, I'm I'm trying. I'm trying to read as well. Um, in short, we're proposing to build 55 buildings, 55 units. Uh, within each each building, there'll be four separate units. I'm trying, ma'am. I'm like right on the. Okay. I, all right. I'm gonna. This is gonna be totally disgusting because my mouth will be all over this mic. So, again, I'm sorry. 55 buildings, uh, four units per building. Approximately each unit would be 1,350 square feet in, in size. Uh, within each unit, we're proposing three bedrooms, two and a half baths, and each eat in kitchen, two living rooms, a laundry room, an office flex room, and a covered patio, and a one-car garage. Uh, each unit will also have its own uh, backyard, our own private yard. In total, we're proposing seven, uh, about seven and a half or 7.6 acres of green space and parks within and outside the development. Uh, that'll include a, a 0.6 acre park uh, for the, the residents, as well as a 0.7 uh, acre uh, dog park, as well as a, a picnic trail within the community, and then uh, a third of an acre of green space. As you can also see from the proposed site plan, uh, as part of our wor working with staff, we had proposed to do a um, walking trail or green belt, I'm going to say on the southern side of, of the development. We understand there is a significant amount of concern with the proposed trail and its placement. We, we did not dictate the placement of the trail. Uh, we were just asked by staff to, to uh, if we could, you know, allow for it to be constructed. Actually, we would construct it, and the city would would uh, maintain it going forward. We we said we certainly would, and I think that's part of our requirement in terms of park dedication. Uh, on the northern side of the property, I'm, I'm going to say northwest or north northern side of the property, we will be constructing an eight-inch masonry wall. Uh, uh, between us and, and the neighboring properties. And on our side of that wall, we're, we are building, our, our, I'm sorry, not building, but planting uh, at least one sh a large shade tree per, per uh, residence. That's a requirement of our PDD. And as, and as Mr. James had mentioned, uh, you know, we are going forward as a PDD. So everything that we're proposing to do, everything that you see um, in this plan is what we'll have to construct. We can't deviate it. Uh, can't deviate from it at all. If we if we do, we have to come back to this commission and council for that that consideration. <clears throat> one thing one thing of note um, is that all of the buildings within this particular community are going to be part of a homeowners association. I'm not sure if any of y'all 
or how many of y'all live in a homeowners association, but each each unit uh, will be part of a homeowners association, a, a mandatory homeowners association that will collect dues um, and uh, enforce the deed restrictions for each building. So if I own a particular building and I let it fall in disrepair and one of the commissioners owns a building uh, next to me, you'd be able to enforce your restrictions like you would in any other, any other homeowners association. Also, the homeowners association and the dues that are collected are going to be used to maintain the front and rear yards of these uh, residences, so we are, we're not having to count on individual uh, own building owners or residents to maintain those yards uh, e either in the front and back. We think that will go a long way in, in um, um, keeping up the community in terms of its overall appearance. A couple of other, other things to note is this will be completely gated. Uh, you'll need uh, uh, remote, uh, as my wife would say, Ladili Bopper to enter into the community at, at both areas. Um, we'll have security, security cameras as well. Um, I, I know there's, uh, there's been a lot of, obviously a lot of opposition, a lot of discussion, a lot of concern uh, from the neighbors about this type of development. Um, you know, there's only so much I can say to, uh, to, to you all in, th in that regard. I will tell you, uh, I've represented developers, homeowners associations um, in this, I here in, in, in this area for the last 20 years. And uh, one thing we're seeing in the market is that it's, it's changing. Uh, there are a lot of folks that, um, that don't want to buy a home or don't want a home at home anymore. They want to be able to rent, uh, pack up and go, and, uh, or be, you know, be in a position where they can, they can leave and, 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 and get an RV and travel around. So we're seeing a lot of change in the market with respect to folks not necessarily wanting to, to buy single family homes. And in this type, of, this type of community, this type of product, we're seeing a lot of success because that's what the market is, is dictating. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have a lot else to add. I, again, I want to thank your staff for all their work, and I would respectfully request you follow your staff's recommendation and recommend approval of this zoning request to Council. Uh, I'll be available to answer questions after the uh, citizens make their uh, comments as well. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner, members of the Commission. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pinson. All right. So, um, Shortly here, I will um, open the meeting for public input. It's a lot like uh, residents to be heard. Um, one at a time, as, as you see fit, you step up to the microphone and, and address the commission. And once again, uh, try to keep it to three minutes. All right? So if you hang on, just give me just one second, okay? All right. All right, we'll open the public hearing at uh, 9732. Sir, name and address again, please. Uh, Jorge Rodriguez Solis at uh, Foxfire 3334. Uh, Mr. Benson, correct? Uh, sir, so I know that this is part of the North Cliff Section 2, Weatherlupe County, Texas, according to the map plans um, recorded for volume four, page 54 through 57. Uh, this is a single, uh, I could be mistaken, but uh, are those 25 acres being purchased part of this deed restrictions? If I may, let me, if, if I could, and just again, I probably should explain this. Typically the way the process works, unless the chair chooses, is we'll note the questions that you ask, and often what the, the commission will do is have staff get up, and even the applicant, to try to answer those questions as best we can. So again, we don't do a back and forth. I mean to okay. take your time, but we'll do it that way. I don't want to run my time. That was like a minute taken. So anyways, that would be my first question. My second question would be, if those part of those deed restrictions, which have fall under North Cliff, and North Cliff is a homeowner's organization, then how is it that you're able to start your homeowner's organization? Does that mean that the North Cliff homeowner's organization and homeowner's organizations that are affected by it no longer exist? That would be my other question. Two, uh, you say that you take notes for the better, uh, better well-being of the neighborhood and its uh, citizens that live within it. Uh, but you failed to mention a lot of the major concerns, which is one, traffic control, uh, schools. Uh, my kids sometimes uh, are late to school by anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and sometimes arrive home up to an hour to sometimes two hours late because the school cannot facilitate the transportation. Uh, three. 
uh, they said that in average, if you have 200 units, right, uh, for a school that's overcrowded, that's 200 students, the average family, right, American family, I have two kids. But what's to say other families don't have more? So if the average uh, household right there has two kids, that's not 200. That was just being kindly. That's actually like 400. Um, the other thing would be, uh, man, I, I don't like the three minute kind of, kind of a thing, right? But um, as far as the, the notification for our residents, right, it's not just the 200. You're affecting every single one of us, right? And the most importantly, right, which I quite frankly don't understand why you would uh, veer away from this question, would be the security of the people. With all due respect, your cameras and your gate does not protect the citizens of our community, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, to include, right, include, please give me more than three minutes, it's a lot of it was taken away. Um, I, I don't understand how, how you can, quite frankly, just kind of sit here. Can I have a little bit more? A little bit. I don't understand how you could just kind of sit here and just tell us about how great this program is going to be for us when you're not the one being affected by it. Right? Like, how is it? There's plenty of land off of 35 going towards New Braunfels of empty lots. Right? I love your quote. RV, pick up and go. Why won't you pick up and go to go to an empty lot where there's no homes being built? where there's no residents being affected. That would be a much better plan. The other thing, as far as this uh, plans right here from the Guadalupe County, right, you have 30, 30 days. It doesn't say a certain portion of citizens need to be notified. It says the North Cliff organization, right? So why is it that only a select few are being chosen and being told of what's gonna happen in this community when we're all being affected? That's the other thing. So, I mean, that's all, man. Just let me point out, I, I understand you're all, this is very important to you, and you all want to express your support. But the speaker has three minutes, and when, and when you do the applause and the yelling and they stop, that's their time that you're taking away from them. Okay, so just please give them some consideration. All right, name and address, please. My name is Lisa Kelly, and my address is 47, uh, 3708 Scenic Drive in uh, Scenic Hills. I just have a couple of things that I wanted to say. Number one, I, I'm really concerned about the density. I think that there's a lot of better options at, to, to develop that property that might not be quite so dense. And the other thing that I'm really concerned about is the fact that these are being sold as individual units to investors to rent out, those investors are not going to be living in this homeowners association, and a homeowners association is only as good as the homeowners who participate in it. And if they're living in California, they're not gonna care that their neighbor next door's property is falling apart. Thank you. All right, thank you. Evening, Commissioner. My name is Brandon Goggins. I live on 3401 Foxbriar Lane. And little, little. Yeah, 3401 Foxbriar Lane. A lot of our concerns are just going to be keep getting hammered to you guys because we want you to understand how how important it is to us. So for us, the gated community is that's their thing. That's not going to be our thing. We are a community as a whole. Another issue is going to be the police and EMS. I want you to guys realize that we've already felt like shirts. Where we are, we're annex shirts. We are the out child. We are the beaters. We get hammered with the streets are bad, the parks are bad. We've had a pool for two years that doesn't function. It makes no sense. So now y'all are going to, again, put another thing out there that doesn't look. You would never do that to Jonas Woods, Woodland Oaks, Ashley Place, Greenshire. Y'all wouldn't do that to them because they would be here rioting right now, and they're the biggest taxpayers, so y'all would applaud that. And that's okay. I get it, man. Um, the police aspect, they're there, we see them, but I want y'all to like look at and research the timelines that it takes for them for a call. I got neighbors, my mom in that neighborhood, Miss Linda Goggins, 19 minutes on the floor dead before someone showed up. She was dead, yes, she was DOA, so that's a thing, but she was DOA, 19 minutes, no one responded. Understand that, 19 minutes, look it up. Linda Goggins, understand that. Like, 
We are the outskirts of shirts. Yes, there's an EMS station right there on the side of the highway. I want you, yeah, great, that's three. But when they get called, because station two, I'm medical, station two gets called, Station three gets called, and now station one on the other side of the city has to respond. That's a 30 minute response, guys. We don't have that over there. We are Annex Church. You guys have nothing over there for us once we get pulled. Realize we're, we are Annex Church, and that's how I look at it. So consider that whenever you consider this, and then you add another 200 people. My wife spoke earlier. You're gonna add all these children. Our schools, man, we are, our timelines on our school buses are so delayed, it's, in, it's insane, guys. To see high school students get home at 6.30 at night and still have to go to school at eight o'clock in the morning, don't get me wrong, that is a thing. I get it, I, I know we're short staffed, but what's it gonna happen in a year and a half? Are y'all gonna populate that? Are you gonna access that? Are our teachers gonna be there to benefit that? Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. In the yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate you. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for everybody who volunteering their time today. My name is Ryan Rex. I live at 3302 Turnabout Loop. I'm also a business owner at 116 Windy Meadows Drive, both in shirts. Um, when it comes to this, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is the traffic, 200-some uh, units with three parking spots each. That sounds to me like 600 possible vehicles. Um, can anyone here imagine 600 more vehicles on 1103 in the morning? Uh, what about on Columbia? Two to 600 more vehicles in the morning? I can't even imagine it. Um, that is uh, my, my main concern, also just for safety reasons. When I moved and bought my home in 2017, I chose shirts because it, th that area, North Cliff, is single family, and I, I grew up in apartments my whole life. I wanted to live away from that, and that's why I chose shirts. Right now, there are young people looking for places to live. Are they gonna choose shirts? I hope so. Um, all I'd like to say at the end is people over profits. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. My name is Patrick McMaster. 3604 Elm Court. In the interest of brevity, I'm not gonna repeat everything I said before you've all heard it. Just have a couple of additional things I would like to say. Everybody's objecting to the walking trail. Well, the plan only includes a walking trail because the city said it, they wanted it. The developer doesn't wanna put it there. The other residents in the area don't want it there. We don't want a walking trail right along our backyard. Some of these property lines, eight feet from their house to the edge of their property. And then you're gonna stick a walking trail there. You wouldn't want that in your backyard, would you? Okay. Staff recommends to the Planning and Zoning Board. And then you gentlemen have the job of, rec and lady, sorry, have the job of recommending to the, board, the City Council. Please take that seriously and listen to all the citizens here. I personally want to apologize that some of them got irate. I've been on your side of the, of the table. You have to listen to it and it's a shame. Your planning and zoning is supposed to recommend based on laws and input from the community. Well, you've definitely heard a lot of input tonight, and I've read through all the laws, and before I cited different paragraphs of the laws that this development doesn't meet. The land use document for the city says it should all be single family homes. That's all we're asking for, is that you make it single family homes. That's all I've got to say right now. Thank you. You're welcome.
Good evening, my name is Paul Kenzior. I live at 5713 Fairways Drive in Sherrits. Uh, first off, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the committee for volunteering their time, energy away from their families. I'm very familiar in the fact that civil service can be a thankless and stressful job where you're making hard decisions. I'm gonna get right to the point and keep this short. My neighbors have brought up a number of wonderful points and concerns of things that we're worried about. I simply wanna ask a few questions for the board that I don't expect an answer back because of the questions that I ask you to ask of yourselves. <clears throat> First off, in your flume, it has this designated as single family. When the city was creating the budgets and, and earmarking funds as we're going to annotate our taxes and everything to get ready to, to develop these areas, has money been set aside to prepare for the essential city services and the emergency services to get in front of the growth and the growing pains that this is gonna cause? And I'll ask again in that, considering the fact that Homestead, the neighborhood just slightly to the north, East is uh, also zone PDD. And in it, there is marks for an apartment building. There is marks in it for condos. Has the city done anything to prepare for the influx of people that's gonna happen as soon as 2025 is what they're uh, saying for, I believe it was the condos? Are we, are we being sure that the city is being proactive instead of reactive because we only need look to our neighbors to see what happens to a city when they allow development to run amok. The last thing that I'll ask the committee to cons uh, consider and ask themselves is that this committee has a duty to their citizens to provide for their safety, to provide for their financial well-being, to provide for their happiness. Every resident in these communities made investments in their homes and with their families here in regards to the plans that the city had recommended. I myself, when purchasing my home in 2022, looked at the flume and seen that the golf course, which having spent 20 years in the area, I knew was not gonna be a golf course anymore. I looked at it and saw this is zoned single family. And I ask you guys to take heed to the, uh, the words of our assistant uh, city manager there and to really consider, do we want to test this project out by getting to play with our words and saying, well, single family means this and it's kind of that, simply because these, do, these fourplexes have an upstairs component? Uh, I hope that you guys ask yourselves these questions and if the answer is no, then I ask that you guys vote no on this rezoning or at least table the motion until we can get the information to make informed decisions. Thank you. Richard Moss, 3434 Wimbledon Drive. I spoke earlier about uh, the, the problem with traffic and back when they did change the uh, frontage road from a two-way to a one-way, I went to several meetings with the, with the state and all that on why they were doing that. And at that time it was brought up that Country Club, to have it have a overpass. Now, if he wanted to pay for the overpass, I think he would actually get somebody here that would say something nice about him. So far, I haven't heard that. But if you're willing to pay for the overpass, I'm sure that people here would think a little bit nicer of it, because then you would actually bring something to the table here. When I moved here 40 years ago, I actually moved to Austin. The very first property I had was a rental property. It was a duplex. I lived in one half and rented the other. And that's how I started my real estate career, so to speak. And the first thing you know is all the duplexes there were two bedroom, two bath. And the reason they were two bedroom, two bath was because then you had two parking spots. Anytime you have the number, the general rule is for the number of bedrooms is the number of cars you're gonna have. If you have a three bedroom, you're gonna have three or more. Anybody that's had kids, at one time we had five cars. So the idea that, and when you put that up there, the, the parking spots, his suggestion was two parking spots. And I would really like that answer. How many parking spots are gonna be available to the people? Because that's a very big question. Like I said, I saw that firsthand owning properties. And the whole idea of an absent HOA makes absolutely no sense. That's not an HOA. That's, you know, I was, I've seen plenty of absentee owners. 
That makes no sense at all. And then also, when he spoke about having backyards, if you look at the plan, the majority of them do not have backyards. They're down the center as a back-to-back -back units. There is no backyard. And then how he's going to take care of the backyards on the other ones means they can't have fences in between. He's not going to come in the back and let you, let you put your dog out. They're going to run the lawnmower across there, and there will be nothing to keep anything going from one end to the other of this mess. So I really think you should think twice about especially this situation here. This makes absolutely no sense to me at all. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Douglas Young. I have 3701 Hillside in Shirts, Texas. I'm a former building inspector, a former planning commission, planning commission commissioner, and a zone, zoning flood control item. At this point, I believe the staff has missed several items in regards to the plans that are submitted. If you will note on the plan, there's a buffer noted to the one side of the property. The buffer zone is 20 feet. The 20 foot buffer zone runs from the subdivision to the back of the physical building itself. It is not a backyard. Therefore, the people do not have a backyard. The wall that's constructed on that, if it is, if it is planted with the plantings that they require, it is going to be very much a problem. They also need to look at the parking requirements under the provisions for R4s because there is not enough accessory parking for other than the family members and the direct unit people in the area. I have one other question. The application was originally filed on, on February the 17th of this year. The second question is the property owner or the presenter in this, in this facility was not a owner of the property until May the 26th, and therefore how was the application submitted in compliance with the code which requires the owner to submit the land. So it was submitted three months prior to. Is that a legal question? Yes, sir. I turned it off, I'm sorry. Uh, someone's taking notes and we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer all the questions after we, we finish the input. So, still your time. Uh, my time is related as a staff member, knowing what the staff is. Those items that were pointed out are things that staff needs to review on this in regards to that. They are also as a consideration for that, for that uh, walking trail that is a high power tension easement and as of the time that before this meeting I have a call in and have not responded to the requirement from past experience in other communities and other states no access to that property whatsoever construction elements or anything else so therefore it needs to be reviewed and considered otherwise Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome, sir. Good evening, lady, gentlemen. Uh, my wife, Cheryl, and I were not born and raised in Shirts, Texas, but doggone it, we got here as soon as we could. We really like living here. We moved here about a year and a half ago from the other side of San Antonio. And when Excuse we me. moved into... I need your name and address, oh, please. James Beckman. 3632 Chestnut Court. Thank you. Shirts. So anyway, we moved here a year and a half ago from the other side of San Antonio, more or less, and uh, we recognized the growth in this part of the, uh, the region going gangbusters. And when you look at the stats, you know, population of, I don't know, whatever it was, a few thousand in 2000, and now it's a gazillion. I cannot imagine what's on your plate to deal with or how big your plate is, but I really do appreciate your consideration of our neighborhood planning, the density plans, the safety, the consideration of our utilities and the infrastructure. So my only comment about this particular development is that it just looks inappropriate. 
I, I, I applaud the developers for getting as much squeak out of the pig as they can. You know, all the pork and the squeak. The high density development and it just doesn't look appropriate, you know, for the neighborhood. That area around there is single family houses and that's what should be built there in my opinion. It should be zoned single family and real single family houses built in that neighborhood. We also have 24 or 25 houses that back up to that southeast property line of the proposed property in the scenic hills community. And those neighbors, and of course I live just a block inside of that. But anyway, so we as a neighborhood are, and I don't know if I can speak for we, because it's just me standing here, but there's a concern about security, uh, you know, along that uh, property line there and a concern about the maintenance of our real estate there. You know, we, man we maintain that property out into, uh, you know, uh, some distance from the houses, the back of the houses there, with irrigation and, um, you know, a single contractor maintaining the landscaping and so on. And so we want to be able to keep that. We want to keep the, the view up across that green area. We understand it's, a, it's a, um, an easement it's not going to be built in, so um, a fence would be good if the developer could put a fence in along there, back from our real estate to maintain the property, you know, to maintain people's backyards and single family houses. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ray Martin, 5701 Whistling Straight Shirts. I'd first like to say I understand thoroughly with what y'all have to do. I served on a board like this in this area for several years and then served as mayor for six years. So I understand how the process works. I understand it can be frustrating for y'all as it is for us. I'm a realtor by trade. I sit back and listen a lot, didn't sign up to talk in the first round, but I picked up so much by listening. These are going to be, and, and, and I'll say this is a businessman here. He's trying to peddle his wares, okay? He's going to sell those, build them, sell them, and he walks away. But a couple of things, I don't know if y'all picked up on it or not. Three bedroom, two bath, with a study, 1,350 square feet. Folks, do you realize how small that is? Yeah. Some of y'all have got walk-in closets in your master bedroom bigger, bigger than some of those bedrooms are going to be. Now, they are touting this as high end, okay? I guarantee you, no matter what they tell you, and he cannot control it. If they get them built, and I'm just using figures, I don't know what they're going to ask for them. I know most of those will bring $1,500 to $1,700 a month. But if they can't get them rented for that, next thing you know, they'll be $1,300, $1,400 a month. And folks, what kind of people do you think we're going to have moving into our neighborhood? Second of all, what they're trying to do, that's the going thing to do for investors right now. Being a realtor, and I do a lot of rentals, I can take you to eight or ten of these within a 30-mile radius of here. I can't take you to one of them that's dropped in the middle of an established subdivision where you've got houses already there. <laughs> having lived out here for 12 years ago, or having lived out here for 12 years, we went through losing the golf course. And when we approached the city, they're like, Y'all find a solution and we'll try to back y'all. We took a hit on our property values. Now, if this goes through, we're going to take another hit on our property values. And I can tell you, have, having lived out here for 12 years, you cannot tell me, count on all your fingers and toes how many times I've been told, well, you know, as far as shirts is concerned, we're the redheaded stepchildren out here. I mean, that's just the way it's been portrayed. So 
I, I would be glad from a, from a, a realtor position to talk to any of y'all, but I encourage you, and I'll be glad to be a realtor that'll go show you a house with 1,350 square feet in it and three bedroom, two bath. It's not pretty. It's not, you're not going to have middle to upper class people that that's where they want to live. They can go to an apartment and get that for less money. So I just, uh, I, you know, you can parade a pig around and pour all the perfume you want on it. At the end of the day, when the perfume's worn off, you still got a smelly pig, okay? I don't mean this anything pointed directly at you, Buck. I realize where you're at on this. But I cannot back what you're trying to do. I really can't. And I ask y'all in all good consciousness to please vote this down. I think, yes, we're not against development. I think if we left it to single family housing, I would say 95% of the people that are standing up here would say, hey, we're with you. <laughs> there it is. All right. But I will offer, if any of y'all want to go see a duplex or a quadplex with that small of a square footage and see what they're building, call me. I'll be glad to take you. In the meantime, I encourage y'all to strongly vote this down. Y'all are here to look out for the city of Shirts. What is the city of Shirts? It's the people that live in it. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Barbara Mansfield Gonzalez, and my family has been a resident of Deer Haven for more than 50 years. Our family has been associated with the golf course and people in Northcliffe and Scenic Hills for more than 30 years. My father and my mother owned nine fifteenths of the golf course for a period of time with some other people to keep it open, to keep it from being developed by a foreign interest so that golf club members would have more to say about their golf club. Um, it is not in keeping the apartments are not in keeping with the surrounding area. Single family homes, I urge you to vote for single family, family homes. We're signing a petition out here. The people who bought this pair of property, they knew what they were getting into. Blue Bonnet Ridge may be a, a, a name for several different properties. I found one in Ennis, Texas. I found one in Baton Rouge. The one in Baton Rouge can't get rid of the mold in their apartments. So villas at Blue Bonnet Ridge sounds like the same bunch of people uh, reinvesting over here. Anybody that reinvests or invests in a town for two years and then leaves is not a part of the community, okay? And these people who, this is what my dad would say. He would say the veterans that served with us in Managua, Nicaragua, as part of an Air Force mission, the Lavox who settled in Scenic Hills, Mr. Williamson, the patriarch of our friends, uh, he's buried in Houston, Sam Houston uh, Military Cemetery, as are my mother and my father. They're not very far apart. They were all members of this club. They, all these people who settled in Scenic Hills and Northcliffe, they were custom, the Northcliffe homes for sure were custom built homes. They were, people were proud. They were, had to be 55 or older to settle there. Um, they expected, uh, they had expectations of a nice place to live. And I have been in towns where the people were not listened to. I taught an Acres home in Houston. They would turn off, that was the Freedmen's Colony after the Civil War. The descendants were still there. They would turn the water off, and the kids still had to come to school. The um, main point is that in Austin, the 
fourplex complex that's across from Westgate Theater. I had a friend named Betty Edgman. She was on a committee that was trying to keep this, these fourplexes that were owned by different people livable. They were horrible from the outside and they were on public display every day when you went to the shopping center. What people can do who invest in properties when they're using this alternative PDD plan that they're so grateful for in their presentation is put four times the living space on my side lot in Austin was 80 by 100 feet. They want to put four times 1350 on one lot. Are, there, are, they, are they expecting to get away with not having 1,200 square feet? Well, I, I need you, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. So I urge you to keep it R6. These people have expectations, and you owe them. These people can settle. They can go by the 78 acres over by Trainer Hale. They'll have make a lot of profit okay. this way. We're not beholden to them for making profit. All right, thank you. Um, did, did we get her address? I'm sorry, 1012 Antler Drive. All right, thank you. My name is Bill Edmonds. I live at 4909 Crestwood Drive in Shirts. I am the president of the Northcliff HOA. We are totally against this. The reason is, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The reason that we are against this, everybody's said it, but you haven't seen the whole picture. Currently, the only way out is going through my HOA if you're going to be going southbound. You're going to add at least 220 cars. Everybody's got one car. There are currently two other portions of property on the golf course that's now owned by Noli that are under contract to be sold. If you allow this 220 unit fourplex to come in, you're going to have to allow the, another fourplex to come in and another fourplex to come in. Or what if it's a major executive office building that wants to build off a of 35 on the frontage road? And you've got a bunch of people that are now working there. If they're going to go south on 35, you're going through one street. Is the city going to buy property from Noli to put another street in on the south side of, or pardon me, on the west side of the golf course to tie into 1103? I don't think so because it can't be done because it's too close to the frontage road signs that are there now. I know about traffic engineering. I hate to say it, but I did go to Berkeley. And traffic engineering was one of my courses. I also did 22 years with Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department working a traffic car. I know about traffic. I've seen it. If you allow this one to go through, there's nothing that can stop you from allowing the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So now instead of 220, we've got 480 or 660 cars traveling through my HOA. Thank you. My name is Betsy Berg, and I live at 4013 Cypress Court in Scenic Hills. And I've been asked to ask some questions. Um, how, what is the minimum amount of time an HOA has to last? How long will this HOA be in existence? The, okay, and what is to prevent Section 8 housing from becoming a part of this new community development. And if a garage is a parking spot, how many of those garages will be used for storage? And 
I personally have a question. <laughs> I sort of looked at the plan and tried to guesstimate how much impervious cover this on the track there would be, and I'm estimating 75%. And we're talking about rain that comes in this area, and it's got this unusual high clay soil that if, the, the, if it's dry, that water just runs. You know, if it's, if, and once it soaks in, then it starts seeping back out. I mean, this soil in this area, I can't even imagine putting this kind of a development on that tract of land. Thank you. My name is Phil Jackson. I live at 3410 Wimbledon. Um, I just wanted to, to point something out that I noticed. Uh, we have a, a developer coming in who is not vested in our community for anything more than to make as much money off of our area as possible and leave. When he presented, I, I, I don't know if you paid attention to the language that he used. He said we're being required to put in an eight foot fence. We're being required to put in shade trees along the backyards. We're being required to put in a walking trail. He's saying we're being required because he doesn't want to do these things because he wants to make as much profit as possible. But he's being required to do these things, so he's going to have to do them. But that tells me he's not vested in our community or in the people that live in that community. Please don't allow people like this to come into our community and degrade it the way that he is attempting to do to us. That's all I have. Gregory Siebel, 3713 Hillside in Church. Again, thank you very much, lady and gentlemen, ladies and staff. I have a couple of real quick questions I didn't get to previous. The demographics of the staff that recommended this, I saw that they recommended this project already. I'd like to know, did they consider the current resident population and their age? If, again, if this is approved, does the PPD apply to subsequent owners? Say that, that this HAID, or, or however you want to say it, this construction company decides, well, we were told on Sunday they already own it. So what if they decide we, because of this or because of whatever restrictions you may include in the next thing, next part of this process, what if they decide they don't want to? Does, does your plan moving forward, if you, if you agree to this R4, does it apply to subsequent owners? No, I would submit to you that they can come in and say, it's already zoned R4, which says I can put in a four-story apartment complex. Please consider that. The comprehensive land use plan designator is, for this area, single family residence. I don't care if you call it a fourplex or eightplex or whatever, there's only one residence, one family living in that one residence. If there's five of them and they're on top of each other, you're gonna call them apartment. If they're set next to each other, they're not? That's a question. It, when, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, Buck, I, Benson is it? I think he said that 7.6 acres was proposed in parks in this development. I would have you remember that what he said was 0.69 I think is what the number was, but less than one acre of that is actually inside this development. All the rest of it is the 100 foot easement that they can't develop anyhow. They're gonna call that a park. They can't do anything with it. And the last thing is, I wanna know is the staff aware that the UDC specifically mentions the Texas Local Government Code. And in it, specifically, it mentions chapter 211.001 that says, if I still have 30 seconds, I can pull it up. It says, for the purpose of promoting the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen, ma'am. 
Uh, I won't be nearly as eloquent as, as uh, the rest of the folks who have spoken probably. Uh, thank you for volunteering your time. I, I appreciate that. I'm military. I work in health care. Real quick, sir, I need your name and address. Oh, I'm so sorry. Don Dendy, 3149 Cameron River. Shirts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was saying, I've, over the last couple of years, I've spent like five months uh, with COVID, fighting COVID at uh, like three different states, out of, uh, out of state, and then I came back and I'm working on it in Texas. Um, and I just got back and found out about this meeting like uh, yesterday, so didn't get notified. Uh, but uh, my family moved to church for the nice neighborhood we live in and uh, it's safe. We have nice neighbors that we know. Uh, we did not move there to be next to a um, apartment complex or condos or whatever exactly we're building here. Uh, the gentleman described it. It sounded great. If you are looking for an apartment, didn't sound great if you already lived there. And I just, uh, foresee a tremendous negative impact to uh, not only myself, but the other uh, property owners in the area. Uh, I'm retiring soon and I plan for my family and, and I to be there here in church and there in that community. And I'll probably, if my property values are impacted the way I think they might be, uh, I will have to consider relocating when I do retire. This, uh, I can't see this having any good impact on the current residents of the community. It'll make traffic terrible. Uh, I don't think it will increase property values in any way. Uh, many, of the pro many of the property owners are retired. And ha at this time when inflation is just horrible uh, and impacting our purchasing power badly already, this is, this is just, uh, having your property values go down, um, I can't see that having a good effect. Uh, I, I would like to add twice in the last year and a half, uh, the sewer system has backed up for our neighborhood and we talked a lot about the traffic for the roads. I think that traffic will probably increase too, uh, so um, I'm just concerned about that as well. And I would ask that if you guys can have whatever influence you can have, please don't vote for this. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Carmen Rodriguez and I live at 5621 Fairways. And I would just like to say right now that I am very proud of all the neighborhood that surrounds me. All these are good people that have worked so hard to keep their homes beautiful, and they are very proud of shirts. And I would just like to say right now that my heart goes out to the people in Scenic Hills. These are elderly people who I'm sure that they have health issues already, and bringing this situation to them right now is more of a nightmare for them. So I ask you, please, you are the, capable for these people to end that nightmare that they're going through right now. Thank you. My name is Miguel Rosado. I live in 6077 Coors Cove. I did 32, 32 years in the Army. I came as a private, retired as a lieutenant colonel, became a nurse, and then I became a family nurse practitioner. I work in the city of uh, San Antonio and around the city as a um, hospice for about five years. And I've been on all houses here in San Antonio. I work for the VA, VA right now. And this is the people that I see at the VA. But while I, were, I was working hospice, I went to all kinds of houses, poor, rich, nice people, ugly people. And one of the worst neighborhoods that I went is when these type of houses they're trying to plan. The next one were apartments. 
The difference is in the apartment, there is administration always taking care of them. But these houses, once the owner rent them, they don't care about it. And I even hire people from those places because they couldn't pay that. And when I went to pick them up for work to work for me in my house, I had to go and get them, and the house was a mess. The garage door was a mess. The neighborhood was a mess. It was totally abandoned. And I don't like this. I work hard to buy this house, and now my wife is telling me, they put this over there, we're moving out. And I don't want to move out, because I love my neighbors. We take care of each other. The many times I saved two lives, because they called Miguel. Miguel, we need you. That's one thing. Now they move a, f a brand new f uh, family next to my door, and they got a little girl. We don't have uh, grandchildren here with us because my kids are all Army and all over the United States. But we are adopting this kind of girl. We love her. And we think it, thinking about leaving this and leaving that little girl that we love so much. I don't support this. And I want you to take care of my feelings rather than that, the money of this community. And we lived here twice. The first time I lived here, it was uh, North uh, Carolina. When I came and I told my wife, we're gonna move out of the San Antonio because I live on base the first time in 1990. And she fought me until she met uh, the city of Church. She loved it. I got orders again. I moved up, out, out of San Antonio. And 12 years later, came back. And I said, we're gonna move a little bit north because this is getting worse. And now we moved here. We've been in here about eight, 12, 12 years? 13. 13 years, and now this. And she said, we're gonna move. And I don't want that. The, the last point is, if I sell, I'm a, um, what is it, uh, Medicare, and I will have to pay money, Medicare, because what I sell in my house is gonna count as income. So I lose twice. My friends, and I lose that little girl, and I will lose money. Thank you for your service, and I hope your heart is in this. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Cheryl Beckman. I live at 3632 Chestnut Court in Shirts in the San or at Sandy Kills community. Thank you for volunteering, and thank you for everybody's input. I, I'm aligned with what people are saying. I have a real estate background and I do know that three bedrooms, two and a half baths, and an office needs more than a one car garage. You're gonna have cars on the street and I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement with the person. They're gonna use that garage as storage, which puts cars on the street. And they're talking about it being upscale. You can call something water, but it doesn't make it wet. It is, <laughs> there is just no possible way that it would be an improvement to the community. And that's exactly what we're looking for in any developer. And I believe, and I'm, you know, this is an upset for everybody. It's just an unfulfilled expectation of what they thought that was gonna be there, like the country club when they moved in, then that's not there unfulfilled expectation, they're gonna do something with that land that's going to improve the properties, but it doesn't appear to be that way. So I, I'd like us to consider the fact that there's a way to solve the problem where it's a win-win for everybody. It looks like the developers already purchased the property, already has the plans. Those plans don't fit the community. And again, we're we, we really want it to be something that would benefit absolutely everybody, but it's like a suit that looks good on the outside, but just doesn't fit. Thank you. Anyone else? We certainly want to, you know, we want to well, sure, come on up. My name is Patsy Laurie. I live at 3504 Wimbledon Drive, Shirts, 
And I truly hope you are hearing us tonight because we are the people who live in the neighborhood. And I am so frightened of looking around. That goes in, somebody who doesn't care about us at all, and start to see the for sale signs in my neighborhood. And I see my neighbors start to try to move out of the neighborhood. And then I see my property values go down at this age. And I think you really have to consider the impact of those property values going down. People have covered tra the traffic and the safety, but that's all I have in life, really, you know, to leave my kids is my house. And I just dread seeing for sale signs all over my neighborhood. So I do hope you are hearing us. Thank you. My name is Brad Weberg, 3809 Overlook Drive, Shirts. I appreciate you guys um, and Gal for the time that you're spending sitting on the butt, because oftentimes that gets sore, your back gets sore, it's, it's uh, nerve wracking. I appreciate those of you that have given attention to what people have said. Those of you that have not given attention, I question. But I want to encourage you, as commissioners, you've got the privilege, the responsibility, the opportunity to make a good decision. Irregardless of what Planning Commission wants to give you as a recommendation, You've heard a lot of stuff tonight, a lot of heart, a lot of concern. These folks are just doing something to make a buck. You've heard our heart, you've heard our request, and I appreciate that you're gonna make the right decisions, so thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Good evening, my name's Eric Vandervelden, 3433 Cliffside Drive. I'm North Cliff's damn Yankee. I moved into the town 12 years ago. That's where I am. This gentleman Sunday talked about his dream. When I moved into North Cliff, I had a dream too. Heck, I married my wife at the clubhouse up in North Cliff. Um, my main concerns are, number one, the schooling. Steele High School right now doesn't have enough desks for their, still, for their students. The kids are sitting in the classrooms in chairs like this, packed 40, 50 to a classroom. The next thing I'm concerned about is the traffic control. Anybody heading south into San Antonio does not want to go up to Schwab Road. They're going to go down through North Cliff. They are not going to go down Morningside Drive because of the speed bumps there. They all go down Cliffside Drive, past my house. Now, you're going to have three, four hundred more cars going back and forth there twice a day. That's a concern to me. My main, my other concern is the crime. One thing I like about North Cliff is it's a quiet neighborhood. There's really not much crime compared to some of the other neighborhoods in Cibolo, Shirts, out on the interstate. The gentleman said he's going to have cameras. The cameras are going to be pointing into his community. They're not going to be pointing out. Nobody wants to have an eight-foot wall outside their backyard. I'm, my house isn't even on that map that you saw earlier. But my neighborhood, my family, my dream, along with everybody else's dream, is going to be impacted by this. I know change is inevitable. I know it's a given, but these four family dwellings, it's, it, it, it's just so out of place. You know, I know you got to change it, and I just recommend going with one family homes. Thank you.
I have 30 seconds left. So I have an invitation that you all come out to our neighborhood and take a look at it from our point of view. We'll walk down Hunter's Glen and Pecan Court and Chestnut Court and take a look at uh, the development from our neighborhood's point of view. We'll order some Subway sandwiches and get some <laughs> iced tea and you know, sit up at the veranda and have a chat and, and just, just take a look at it from our neighborhood's point of view. All right, phone number. Here, I'm going to give you my phone number. No, no it's, that, that's fine. Okay, great. I appreciate the invitation. I feel, I feel I'm being brushed off. Yeah, no. <laughs> but, but do come. Do come and take a look. Well, I'll tell you, at least two of us have been up there. Oh, and good. Looked, so. Well, so you must have been invited because it's a gated community. No, no. <laughs> we, we knew better than to try to get in there. Okay, good. But well, that's anyway, great. Anyway, right. you're welcome to come. Okay. My name is Tammy Kennedy. I live at 3712 Pebble Beach. I am not in the zone for this part, but my backyard does meet on one of the other tracks. I moved here from Houston last year, and the reason I did is because of crime. I never ever wanted to sell my house. That was my home for my kids, but they all moved up here. So grandma had to move too, but it broke my heart to sell my house. Now the person that bought my house, he never came to see my house. He never looked at it. He was from Afghanistan. He didn't care what he was buying or what he did. I went back to my house. A few weeks later, my front door was off the wall. There was trash everywhere. My whole yard, my whole house was destroyed. And that's because of crime. And because of an investor, they didn't care. Nobody cares when you don't live there. My house was one of the prettiest damn houses in the damn neighborhood, and now it looks like crap. I can't even go buy it. And the other day, my neighbor called me and said, Guess what, Tammy? Somebody just got shot a block away from where you live. You know, and that's the way it's gonna happen. I moved into this new neighborhood. I moved there because it was quiet. Back of my house was quiet. I don't see crap go behind my house. But something's gonna change, I know. But I didn't know all this was happening. So I'm gonna have to go with the times too. But as you can see, I have physical problems of breathing. I, I have other problems, health problems. And I told my kids, this is the last damn house I'm gonna move out of. I wanna sit on my back porch and enjoy my house. I don't wanna see no damn brick wall go up the wall, eight foot wall. I've seen them in Houston. It's horrible. You know, if you want Houston crime, keep bringing in the renters. Thank you. I'll be done. Um, Jorge Rodriguez, 3334 Foxfire Lane. Um, you know what? I'm in the United States Army. I'm currently serving as a drill sergeant at Fort Sam Houston. Um, when I came from Maryland, uh, you know, deployed whatever, Germany, went to Maryland, came here. Uh, when, uh, originally from San Antonio, one of the things that actually led me to move into this neighborhood was actually the crime rate. The crime rate was ex ex extremely low compared to other places among San Antonio and so forth. And uh, when I moved into this community, I just totally fell in love. I mean, you're talking about just about every single lot is approximately a quarter acre, uh, just about uh, very well kept up, very well established community. Um, I love every single one of my neighbors. They're all very kind, very loving people. Uh, getting to know a lot of my neighbors, most of them were originally from there, you know, and if they're about my age, it was typically their parents who passed on the house to them, which I'm sure, and I've heard many from, from the people here, which eventually want to do the same. Um, just about every single house within the neighborhood is also approximately uh, 
from when I was doing some of the research is about 2,400 square feet or more. Um, you know, two to three uh, bedroom, uh, actually a three to four bedroom, two and a half bedroom or more. So when I hear this uh, gentleman's plan as far as what he wants to do into our neighborhood, I do see it as a total depreciation value. Uh, my greatest concern is for the livelihood of me, my family, and our welfare, but also to our community and the people that actually live there. Uh, as you well see, my biggest concern, and I ask and I plead out of you to please take into consideration, is the demographics of the people that actually live amongst our community, which just happen to be an elderly community. Uh, and many people have said it, so in conclusion, I'd like to just like to remind you again that if you have people purchase these homes, they're not invested into these homes, they're not gonna stay into these homes, they're eventually gonna rent uh, money, uh, their property to whoever, they're really not gonna care who they actually rent to just as long as they get paid. Thus, zero investment, which is also going to bring the crime rate. Um, that's really my biggest concern, right? It's a crime rate. Uh, the crime rate, I would actually say, would be my number one concern. And just looks among you who is going to be mostly affected. You think most of the people and the demographics of my community is going to be able to defend themselves as well? Keep that in consideration, right? How well do you think they're going to be uh, able to defend themselves? Mind you, he's building a wall right next to an elderly community, all elderly community only. That's why I call him a bully. And I'll say to your face, you're a bully. My name is Jan Baldwin and I live at 3401 Columbia Drive. Um, I am Vice President of the Northcliff HOA and I am here to tell you that HOAs, unless they have deed restrictions with, with fines, they're really very difficult to enforce. Renter people do not care about it. They don't invest in the community. You have to go out of, out of usually out of the city to try and get somebody to repair the building and stuff like that, they're not interested, so you end up having to take them to court. Or I come down here to Mr. James and we discuss to find out what we can do to, to keep these buildings in decent order. So a solution is not an HOA. You, we all know that HOAs are dying. As far as the garage is concerned, we all know that garages are storage here. So we're talking about 2.2 cars or around two cars for a family. One car is gonna be in the street. We already have problems with that. Gated communities, gated communities pe keep people in. They don't keep the people living there out. So I'm looking for um, increased porch thefts and things like that if we have multiple m people moving in like that. Okay, $750,000, you divide it out by four, it's $187,000. Where is this money coming from? You know, where are these people gonna get this money? I work at the food bank and I work for my church charity. I know what kind of money people are having trouble with nowadays. So I don't believe a fourplex is going to be able to keep the property up. I have been in San Antonio for 40 years. My parents bought a beautiful house in Camelot after my father retired from the military. They went in the down the, the street and put in an apartment complex. Now, I see that apartment complex every night, approximately three nights a week, on TV because it was substandard housing. Complexes, apartments and stuff. We hear it on TV between Windcrest and Redmond Road all the time. I don't want my neighborhood to turn into that. Thank you. sure we hear from everybody that uh, that wants to speak anybody 
Going once. Going twice. All right. Public input portion of the hearing is closed. Um, did did you want to speak, sir? All right. We'll reopen it. Thank you. Well, like I said, we want to hear from everybody, so. Appreciate it. My name is Donnie Granger. I live at 5018 Brookhead Lane. So I'm not in the area immediately. It's impacted by the proposed new construction, but I live at the corner of Mayfair Lane and Brookhead Lane, where there's a, there's a street, it's a T intersection, and there's, it's got three right. stop signs at that intersection. But probably one in five cars stop at that stop sign. And in the mornings and the evenings, it's gotten where it's just, it's constant traffic. I mean, it's constant, and like I say, one in five, one in 10 cars may stop at the stop sign, but most of them don't. So if you're at that intersection, it, no matter which stop sign you have, a lot of people are running at the stop sign. And so if you're, if you're at the T and you're turning left or right, a lot of people get where they're not stopping. The people that are traveling down Mayfair, they're not stopping. One in five, one in 10, sometimes one in 15, they just breeze right through. There's, it's like the speed limit is 20 or 30 miles an hour. We've asked for to have speed homes put in that area because the stop sign's not working. And the police can't be there enough to monitor it to enforce it. I mean, they come there one day, it works for, for an hour or two, and it's back like it was before. So the, cost, the traffic's just constant. It, the stop signs might as well not even be there because it doesn't do any good. And like you say, when you add this traffic to what's already going, to, it's already going through now, everybody goes south and they go, they take that, that road. And it, it's terrible. And you have to be really conscious when you're on the road with your animals, with walking your dogs, with, just with your kids. You have to be there. And the way they've done that intersection, the sidewalks, the kids getting off the school bus, they got to jump over the curb to get to the sidewalk because they said with the intersection, they can't have the sidewalk go to the street where the school kids get off the bus, they got to get jump over the curb, walk, walk through the grass to get to the sidewalk. Why they designed it that way, I don't know. It's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, the kids can't even walk on the sidewalk where it's safe for them. You guys, it's a trip hazard. And they got those rumble strips. They say, well, if a blind person walks through there, they have to have notice it. If you're a blind person, why are you, why are you, why are you walking by yourself if you're a blind person in that intersection? I mean, it's, it's, that's like one in a million people do that. That they're walking out there by themselves, in, in an and they're going to know where the streets are going. I mean, how they know where to go? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's not safe, and it's supposed to be six-foot sidewalks are supposed to be added. I mean, five-foot sidewalks are supposed to be added, but they were never added. They did like ten feet for for five feet, and they went back to three foot again. The streets are supposed to be repaved. They repaved the streets, and they did a good job on this on our streets versus what they did to Country Club. Country Club is a joke. That money was just thrown away. I mean, I don't know who did that or who was in charge of it, but they threw that money away. Because it's, it's like riding a boat on the ocean. You don't know which way you're going. You, know, it just, you don't have to worry about it. Speed them sign. The, the street will slow you down. That's all I have to say. appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask one more time. Anybody? Everybody, we've, we, you said your piece. Okay, and try this again. All right, public input is closed. Now, what I'd like to do, uh, Mr. James, if if it's okay with you, is if uh, staff could address some of the questions that were asked. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll try to do it this way for everybody. Some of them are factual kind of questions and I'll, I'll try to give you a, that kind of factual answer and break it out. Some of them are, are probably questions to policy as to why we did this or why we did that. And so I'll try to make clear the distinction between kind of giving you the facts and then giving you kind of the recommendation and the basis of it that, that you know, certainly both are, are subject to debate, but, but the latter a little more so. So there's a question about uh, deed restrictions on the property. The, the city does not enforce deed restrictions on properties. Um, so to be very clear with that, it would have to be the, the property owners covered under those deed restrictions taking action or whoever is referenced in those deed restrictions would, would have to take action uh, to deal with that. The, the city does not. <clears throat> 
the the next question uh, had to do with traffic, and I, and I will say this was this was likely I think staff's biggest concern on this project, and certainly it's a concern we have looking forward uh, with the rest of the golf course um, because again, it it. Far less traffic comes from a golf course. As the golf course has been vacant, those numbers obviously dropped off and this is an increase. And, and so staff will acknowledge, um, and let me try to pull up, just so, so folks can see, I think you guys certainly know the area, but um, maybe in reference to what I'm talking about, if you'll humor me. Um, real quick. Um, but yeah, the, the, the problem we have here is really country club is, is the primary way we want folks coming in and out of these areas. It's a single uh, collector street that's not loaded with houses on either side. Uh, even on Columbia, it's double loaded. When you get over to Covers Cove, it's not a collector and it's double loaded. And by double loaded, I mean you've got residents who live on either side. And so that volume of traffic they experience in front of their house, uh, which is, is problematic. Um, and then certainly, uh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, many of you I know uh, or have met uh, because you've come to TSAC before, and certainly with TSAC, that's been dealing with traffic issues up in that area. Um, I've, I've reviewed quite a few um, speed studies that we've done up in the area, and again, what we tend to find is a lot of those are um, both concerns with regard to speeding and volume, and again, I think the gentleman uh, did a good job referencing it on Morning Drive on Mayfair where uh, folks who want to go south on 35, their goal is to get back to 1103. Uh, Chelsea is the route that they typically take to do that. There's another orth further down, but typically they're coming through Chelsea. Um, they're driving on Cherry Tree, double loaded, and I'll try to pull up the uh, aerial. Um, so that you can see. So their houses on both sides of Chelsea, or Cherry Tree rather, they're coming down Meadowhead, they're coming down um, the other streets in the neighborhood Mayfair as they find their way there. So I, I certainly appreciate the concern. I think that's certainly a valid concern. I think it did not rise to the level with staff on this project uh, to cause a denial recommendation in terms of the difference between a single family and, and the multifamily. Uh, but as we look at the undeveloped property in the area with the golf course, uh, with the tracts of land over here, I think that is something that, um, you know, at some point we continue to watch and monitor and becomes more and more of an issue going, going forward. So I, I can certainly a appreciate that. Um, the, the next question that was asked is, is about schools. The, the residential units being developed here are in SCUC ISD. Um, we notified the school district of it, had a conversation on Monday when I had a meeting with, with one of the school district folks and just reminded them of this application. Um, for those of you who, who know and are engaged, the school district uh, does a good job putting out district demographic reports. Um, and, and so certainly I think they would say, yeah, it's a challenge as we try to keep up with growth. You know, it's a little bit of a challenge for them with COVID and the pandemic as, as in frankly their enrollment numbers dropped off a bit. Um, they've lost some population in the older parts of town but certainly they are, are a growing district and it's a challenge for them. You know part of what one of the concerns is you know they estimate typically I think this year almost 900 lots coming on in terms of houses. Over a 10 year period they've got about 9,300 additional units coming into their district. You know there was some conversations about discussion of students. I will say that this this is a different kind of product so don't have a good feel for how the district's demographer would estimate it but certainly we've reminded them of that. It's not your typical apartment complex, it's not a single family but their demographer typically sees I think 0.61 students per household. For single family, for multifamily it's about 0.22 per unit coming in, so maybe somewhere in between. But certainly they're aware of the form of the project. They have their demographer who, who takes a look at that uh, going forward, and it's something that they're certainly dealing with in terms of growth, and, and the city tries to deal with them as well. We meet monthly with the school district leadership. Um, again, I attend and sit on the uh, CIAC uh, committee for the school district to make sure they're up to speed on growth and development, and we understand how those issues impact them. Uh, but, but again, in Texas, we have independent school districts, and the school districts run their business, the city runs our business. Uh, we try to work in unison with one another, uh, but again, 
part of it for the district that they tell you if you're in Texas and you're in this part of Texas, it's planning for that growth as best you can, and much like the city, trying to keep up with growth and development, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, the, the other thing that folks talked about a bit is, is crime and safety. Um, I, I probably have a bit of a different perspective on that than I think many of the folks here mentioned tonight. You know, when I, when I started 25 years ago sort of doing uh, local government work and talking to folks and talking to police, generally what they said is, yeah, you get people, you tend to get crime. Uh, you don't get a whole lot of calls out to a vacant field uh, occasionally, but, but when you have things, whether it's a nice high-end neighborhood, whether it's a more moderate price neighborhood, whether it's an apartment complex, whether it's an HEB, whether it's a Trader Joe's, when you get people out in those areas, when you get cars, you get stuff, you, you tend to get that sort of activity. Um, but, but and, and I certainly appreciate some of the lessons and conversations about apartment complexes that um, have declined, didn't start out well, crime emanated from, that certainly also exists with single family residential neighborhoods. Um, and I think there are a lot of factors to it. And so that's one I'd probably take issue with, again, with the city of Shirts, and this leads into this point. You know, we, we have a number of apartment complexes. We, we have the folks, you know, just across the street in Val Verde that I get periodically get calls uh, with issues that they've got, larger issues associated with the community, issues, you know, in their vicinity. Um, you know, it's also Sycamore Creek, it's the Palmera, it's Legacy Oaks, it's, um, you know, Merritt Lakeside. Uh, again, one of my roughest meetings with, with a group of the residents out at Merritt Lakeside and issues that, that they had and wanted the city to do things. Uh, but certainly when we had the, the freeze a year ago and, and we had issues with pipes and apartment complexes without water and we were delivering water to apartment complex and trying to assist through, um, maybe I just have a different perspective that these folks, uh, a lot of them, while some of them are more transient, um, we also have folks in the military that are somewhat transient, uh, but we have a lot of those folks that have a long history here in our community, uh, are part of the community that we meet with on a regular basis. Um, and, and so a little bit of a different perspective for the city that we see how they contribute, we, we see how they have issues the same way everyone else does that we try to help them with. And so I can appreciate the concern that w more development coming, more people, there may be more crime. Again, I think staff just takes a little bit of a different perspective in terms of the type of apartment development that we get in City of Shirts and, and the type of folks that live there uh, that, that we interact with and, and, and talk to. Um, there was a question about, again, PD and EMS response, and certainly this commission knows we talk a lot about as we have growth and development, whether it's Northern Shirts, Southern Shirts, even Central Shirts, how we keep up with that infrastructure Again, in Texas, with the system we have, roads tend to lag. You got to get the people, you got to get the traffic, you get funding. Again, that's why 1103 is the way it is. That's why 1518 is the way it is. That's why Eckert's the way it is. That's, that's why Maskey is the way it is. Uh, unfortunately, you, you have that stuff coming. It takes a while for the roads to, to catch up. And, and certainly, we, we, we try to keep up with PD and, and EMS. And one of the challenges, again, in terms of <coughs> PDM EMS is, you know, unfortunately the city of Shirts does not have the most efficient shape, as much as we love it, uh, for providing city services, and some of you know this, it is a backwards Z shape. So we have a lot of frontage on IH35, we have a lot of frontage down on I-10, and we've got kind of a route in between, and so one of the things that we tend to see is as we get more growth and development, you know, then we tend to, to, to have more of those services up in those areas, be it parks, be it police, be it fire. Um, again, I think if you talk to most department heads, they say, yeah, we could use more folks. Uh, but certainly a question, you know, we, we are adding uh, PD and fire. Again, we're adding a traffic officer this coming year in the proposed budget. We're adding two school resource officers in the proposed budget. We're adding IT person dedicated to public safety. We're adding three firefighters. So again, it's, it's a challenge to keep up. We're adding EMS folks as well. It's not to say that necessarily it's where we want it to be, but as we grow, we're able to add additional folks and that help, helps to supplement. So may not, not be where they want to be. In terms of park facilities, don't disagree. This, this lacks relative to central shirts, similar to where southern shirts lacks. Uh, Windy Swan's being replaced by a splash pad. Uh, we are just struggling to get in materials and the, the contractor is doing the same. I know park staff was headed out there this morning for the asbestos survey, so again, it's, it's working slower than we would like. Uh, again, not uncommon with the challenges we're having with materials and supplies. 
the signal at Elbel in front of Clemens, we're just waiting on the signal boxes. We think TxDOT may loan us some, uh, and fingers crossed, maybe that goes up Friday. Uh, but I, I, can, I can appreciate that. Again, we've applied for grants for Hill, Heritage Oaks and Hilltop Park uh, to try to improve those to provide more amenities. Uh, with regard to the trail system, certainly I think from staff perspective, this is not the first time we, we've heard those concerns. We in fact heard those concerns when we ran the trail up the LCRA easement or uh, from Schertz Parkway uh, that was recently completed and we had the groundbreaking on and again we found it to be very popular. Again we do work with those utility companies in terms of providing those trails underneath the uh, high overhead line so that is something we do. It is something we don't have to work through for. Um, you know, one of the, the issues that, um, kind of work through here, sorry as I catch my place. In terms of sewer service, again, the applicant will have to demonstrate adequate capacity, may have to expand the system. At times, the backups we see are not due to a lack of capacity. It's due to an issue with the line or clog, repair and maintenance, things like that. Um, the, the question was asked about the PDD um, and whether that applies. The PDD, the zoning runs with the land. So it doesn't matter if ownership changes, the zoning stays with the property until council were to come back and change it in, in the future. Uh, you know, another question had to do with garages being used as storage. This commission has talked about that a lot with garages being used as storage and cars parking on the street. That's a problem we have in many neighborhoods in City of Shirts. I think, frankly, the only one we don't probably have it on to some degree is Laurites down south, which are over half acre lots um, and very big, and, and we don't tend to have it there, but many neighborhoods we do. I want to touch on a question with regard to Section 8 housing and, and to sort of clarify some things and what the city's role is a bit. Um, Section 8 housing, the program refers to a Section 8 housing voucher program. So it's distinct and separate from a tax credit project that's built. That's the other thing we tend to run in, which people talk about is workforce housing, low income housing, but essentially that is tax credits are used to help fund the construction of that. And with that, depending on the criteria set at the time and in the program it's going through, a certain percentage of the units have to be rented to people whose median income is below a certain level. That's a tax credit project. It's not what we understand this to be. Um, the Section 8 is a voucher program, and essentially what that is for people who meet uh, income criteria, income limits, they get a voucher to help provide housing or supplement the housing payments that they have. Um, and the property owner can choose to take those vouchers or choose not to. Uh, if a if, if a person with Section 8 vouchers wants to rent a place or certain criteria of the quality of that, but, but all of that is to say the Section 8 voucher program, those can be used for anyone who chooses to accept them who would rent a house or an apartment or things like that. So we probably have a lot of folks in our neighborhoods that uh, are paying with Section 8 vouchers when we may be surprised with that. So that's how that program works. It's separate, the city doesn't regulate it, um, but, but distinct from a tax credit uh, going forward. There was a question about the fence in the open space. So the fence on the, is proposed on the far north side of the property, which leaves the open space in between the buildings serving essentially as a backyard uh, for those, those units. Um, let me see what else sort of have. Um, so, so I will say there was a question about the minimum time frame of the HOA. What the city does is when a project comes in a residential subdivision that has a common areas, we then require an HOA to be put in place to remain in perpetuity uh, to maintain those. But again, it's up to the people who take control over it and what they do with it and things like that. We've had that issue in single family neighborhoods um, as well. And, um, so yeah, again, because this runs, th there was a question about is this multifamily, is it apartments? Staff considers it from kind of a zoning perspective as multifamily depending on the number of uh, units on a particular lot. Um, I think staff looks at this and would say it's distinct and different than a typical suburban style apartment complex, but it is not, it is also very separate and very distinct 
from a single family detached subdivision. It, it sort of is what it is. I think see it for what it is with the issues and challenges and things that, that sort of come with that um, going forward. And I think I've tried to touch on most of those as best I can. Oh, there was a question about, I'm sorry, there, the last one in on a separate note, was a question about the application and the owner. So the, the application came in initially uh, and was deemed incomplete. A month or so later, they, it was complete. At that time, uh, Ron Holly, on behalf of Nolly Caribbean, signed off on the application. Sub subsequent through the process, um, we got um, a, a signed application, or we got notified in a deed indicating that the ownership had changed and they were converting the application under that new ownership. So we are aware that the ownership has changed as they've moved this forward through that process. So I think that's it. But I can answer any questions the commission may have at this point. All right, thank you, Mr. James. Okay, uh, commissioners, comments, questions? No, ma'am, not, not from the public. Um, Mr. James has made the offer that he'll, that he'll stick around for a little while. Um, also, if I may, offer, um, feel free to call. Uh, if, you, if you don't get a question, you don't feel like you got the answer you wanted tonight, don't feel, go ahead and call the city. Um, 311 will connect you. Um, got a stack of business cards on the counter there. Well, okay, but you can ask him after. It, it, the the public the the two the the public input is closed okay so all right so now it's our turn anybody yeah we had the staff presentation uh, two hours ago <laughs> what's that it's hurtful no that's me I did it. I like talking. No, Brian, Brian did it. Brian, did it. Um, Brian, let me look here real quick. I, I've got a couple. So um, I, I, I talked to staff about the um, the utility easement there, the power line easement. Be, because it's 100 foot wide, there's no requirement for that that for that eight foot masonry wall on that side of the subdivision, correct? So the applicant is coming in with a PDD, and as such, the applicant can modify the standards. Okay. He's, as part of this, he's not proposing that masonry wall on the south side of the property. Okay. Um, so certainly the commission, one of the things you could do, as I talked about, is add provisions to the PDD. Um, so uh, not required to put a fence in there either then, correct? That's correct, not for the PDD. Okay. All right. Um, and again, to be clear, he's got a, I believe, an eight, or, or he's got a wood privacy fence on the backs of the units right. on the north side, so yeah. you could certainly require something on the south. So the wood fence, uh, that'll be 100 feet from there to the, That's to exactly the, edge, right. of the edge of his property. Um, yeah, and, and part of what I saw watching the council meeting last night is, is the, the, that I don't think certain people really grasp the difference between a PDD and straight zoning. Right. Um, the plan development district um, is an opportunity, and, and I think part of what I saw last night, uh, I've always been a big advocate that if the developer wants something different mm -hmm. than what's required in our code, what is the city getting in return? Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've said that to you before. You have. Um, it, it's kind of a give and a take. So it allows the city the flexibility to maybe have the developer do some things that he wouldn't be required if he if he if he would just come in and do straight R4 zoning, okay. Um, so I'm assuming since street dimensions are not mentioned in the PDD, they'll be in accordance with the with the Unified Development Code. That is the, that yeah. is correct. But again, so, we understand he's going to do a private street subdivision to gate it. Yeah, but he, doesn't he still have to meet our he has minimum? To meet our normal standards. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm a long-term Schertz resident, and on-street parking is always an issue, um, but our minimum residential pavement width, um, while it sometimes turns it into, if you've got people parking on both sides of the street, it turns it into Illinois Street, but there's still plenty of room for fire trucks, school buses, garbage trucks. Um, okay, so what else did I want to ask? 
Uh, I did want to address the emergency response time because one of the, one of the speakers hit it right on the head. You know, I spent 25 years. My previous life to P and Z was in the Schertz Fire Department. I spent 25 years with them. When, when I started as a volunteer in 1989, we were backing up Bracken Volunteer Fire Department and the Northcliffe Volunteer Fire Department, and that was a good 18 to 20 minute response for us. Our station was down here by the library on Church Parkway. Um, and so I was with that department as, as, as we were, as the city was growing, as the department was growing. Um, and uh, you, what the gentleman says is exactly right. You know, you've got these people live right across the street here from our main fire station, which is right behind us over here. Two minute response time, unless engine one is out on a, out on a call already. So now who comes? Okay, well you got station three out on Lower Seguin Road, and you got Station 2 up at 482. Well, the other thing Schertz initiated several years ago, um, because our dispatcher also dispatches the Cibolo Fire Department, uh, those two departments agreed on um, closest unit. Okay, now I live in Savannah Square up here on the hill, and I will tell you, uh, three times out of five, I will see a black and silver Cibolo fire truck before I see a, a red and white shirts fire truck because the computer looks and says, they're closer, send them. So indirectly, you folks are, are, that live in Northcliffe are seeing that, 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 that are benefiting from that. Um, Cibolo just built a brand new station on 1103. Now it's way south of you. Um, but as these two cities grow, they're kind of working, I think they're working a little together. Um, and, um, the city, our city council, I think, has taken a much heightened interest now in public safety than they did 30 years ago when we started out. I think they're much more attuned to, um, to trying to provide the better service. Uh, but yeah, a lot of times it's just luck of the draw, you know, as to who's, in, who's available to take the call. Um, anybody? I mean, I've got some more things, but I don't want to... I've, I've got a question, couple of questions. Go ahead. Uh, Brian, I'll, I'll call it the south, the south side of this development mm -hmm. where the, the uh, power line easement is. So there's, there's going to be a, a wooden fence behind the unit, correct? Yeah. Yep. Is that, is that six foot, eight foot? Six foot, I think. I'm not sure it calls it out. Six. Yeah. Plan of six, okay. For the, for the uh, scenic hills residents that live on the other side of the easement, mm -hmm. as it stands now, they're not getting anything. That's correct. So some of, some of those homes have a very small, very short uh, iron fence. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see all of it because I wasn't allowed in there. Um, some of the houses don't have any fence at all. So if they're going to back up against a public park, with a well-publicized public trail going from San Antonio to Austin, what what do, what options do the homeowners have? Put up their own fence or leave it no fence at all? They could choose to do that either way. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in the, in this development, the ownership of each building, in in a normal apartment complex. A company owns all the whole complex. In this one, each building is going to be individually owned. It is, yeah, as we understand it, each building is going each each building is going to be individually owned. You may have someone who owns more than one building. Sure. sure. There's nothing that would preclude them from establishing a condominium regime for a building as well. But one entity would effectively own each lot um, with the building. Yes. Okay, uh, up on the north side, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where we're going to use a backyard as a landscape buffer. Right. Uh, is that going to be one continuous piece of property, or are there going to be fences in between each? I, I don't know that it's specified. We defer to the applicant on that. We don't have a requirement or a preference necessarily either way. Sure.
Is there any situation like this in shirts today? I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything quite like that. You, you may recall the garden homes and the cross vine have an open area that runs between, but they're not separately fenced. Yeah. And then the, the management of the HOA, is that going to be uh, some company resident on the property or just some company somewhere? ones that manage other HOAs. It'd be a professional management company like other ones that manage HOAs in the area. Spectrum, Alamo Management Group, it'd be one of those kind of companies. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Roderick? Yes, sir. Good, afternoon. Good evening. So, uh, one of the questions I had uh, had to do with the uh, whether or not there was an environmental impact study done or is that not required? No, there's not an environmental impact study done on development insurance typically, private development, no sir. Okay, okay. And then uh, regarding the uh, development itself, who will maintain the, uh, the dog park uh, inside the uh, community there? Association. Yeah. The Homeowners Association. Chair, uh, I, I know one of the, the issues that's been discussed several times is the fencing. I'm sorry, the fencing, gosh, dog it. The fencing along the southern side, you know, right now it's proposed to have a, I think C Commissioner Broad had, had mentioned, right now it's proposed to have a six foot wood fence behind the residence and then there'd be a hundred foot, you know, easement area or a hundred foot right of way. We're, we're open to fencing the side closest to Scenic Hills if, if we can get permission from CPS to, to do that. We're open to installing another six foot fence along that side if that would be the desire of this commission and those residents. But, but anyway, we, we're, we're open to doing that, sir. Just want to make that clear to the commission. All right, thank you. Anything else? Uh, the only other question I had was uh, what is the, uh, the street width requirement for? Uh, for this uh, particular community? Yeah, it would be a standard city of Shirt street width. They're all residential streets. The right of way width is 50 feet. The pavement width is, you got to talk to your mic. I can't. We think it's 30. Yeah, 30 feet typically back a curb to back a curb. So typically 29 when you count the six inches. From curb to curb. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Anybody? Yeah, I, I missed. I just have not yet been able to make this development compatible with the surrounding area. So, what am I missing? So, so I think Commissioner Evans, it's a, maybe a philosophical kind of different viewpoint that whether or not multifamily is incompatible adjacent to single family. I think staff's position is it's not incompatible. Again, if you look at Valverde uh, across the street, backs up to single family. And again, everything's a little bit different the way it lays out. I, I, I certainly understand that. Um, if, if you look at the Sycamore Creek apartments, the, the same thing. So again, I think there is a compatibility there. I think, you know, one of the things, and this is a, a kind of policy direction of the council and that they've talked about, uh, and I think has become more of an issue over the last few years, is this issue of a need for a variety of housing types, a need for our community to be sustainable. Um, you know, it, it, as, as housing prices have gone up in particular, and I think, you know, when I, I was checking this, people were asking this, the median new home value in shirts in SCUCISD, so not Comal ISD, not East Central ISD, is $422,000. And so that's significant. 
Um, and certainly as interest rates have gone up a bit, as certainly land development costs have gone up that drives up housing prices there. Um, I think our community, as we've talked about what we want to be in the future, we, we've heard from folks and, and say, you know, my child goes off to college, they graduate, they come back, can they live here anywhere? And, and, and so most people in the abstract would say, yeah, we need a variety of housing types. We need apartment complexes, we need some things like this. The rubbing commissioner, I think you hit the nail on the head, is where to put it. And I think the, the policy has been we located in areas appropriate for residential as opposed to located in somewhere not appropriate for residential that, that then you get the negative impacts from those as well going forward. And so again, the Clyde Ford homes down the road, Valverde, Sycamore Creek, part of our community adjacent to single family residential, and that's what this product type is. You know, ironically, we, we've, we've heard a lot before this commission about the issues of pit pads um, and the challenges there, not wanting pit pads in residential neighborhoods. And you know, the idea is, well, maybe if we had a different product type that marketed to those folks, that that's a good fit as well. And so I think it's this fundamental issue from the city's perspective is that as we grow, and as we try to be sustainable, and part of that sustainability is we bring businesses in, in part so we have services close by, in part for the tax base, both ad valorem and sales tax and things like that, those businesses need folks to work there. And they need folks that work in professional jobs that pay very well. They need folks that work in, in lower paying jobs, just like the city does, just like the school district does. And the feeling, I think, on council, let's speak for them, but in terms of discussion we have, is we need to be a sustainable community. And we're not going to be sustainable if we don't have that variety of land uses, the commercial to help offset the residents' taxes, and we don't have a variety of housing types for the folks that work there and, and live here, and then those folks that are just, frankly, in different situations. The folks that, you know, I, I used to live in an apartment complex. I used to live in an apartment complex. And, and many of us have. And, and, and so again, that's just sort of part of it. And so I think part of the reason staff is recommending approval of this is we just fundamentally don't think inherently apartment complexes are incompatible adjacent to residential. And, and you know, what we tend to have happen is when the residents are there first, I can appreciate the concerns, it, it, there, there's opposition to it. But again, as the gentleman said, when we zoned Homestead, we included multifamily adjacent to the residential so that the zoning was in place. We did that with the cross vine as well. And, and again, we have a challenge here in terms of the golf course and, and what happens, but that's frankly staff's position. Yeah, but in all the examples you gave me, including what's gonna happen down south brand new, we, we've done this out on the peripheral on the corner. We set it next to the Mm -hmm. family stuff, but we didn't pop it up in the middle of it. All the apartments that we talk about up here are the same way. We have them on the peripheral of mm -hmm. the development. That, that's what is bothering me mm -hmm. with this one. I, I certainly if, appreciate that. If we had to put this on a corner of where all of this started at, mm -hmm. I think it would be perfect. So and just, you know that I've advocated this kind of housing since 94. So I'm not against what we're talking about here. I just don't know that we've picked the proper location. I'm wondering if there are other locations in shirts. So this one, for example, you feel would be more appropriate for this product? Absolutely, because you got it out on the corner Mm -hmm. away from the majority of the one-story homes. Okay, I can appreciate that. Uh, so just, just one follow-up. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, re regarding the, the traffic, I don't know that, that that's actually been, well, I won't say that. Let me, let me ask it this way. What consideration was given to the traffic pattern that was going to certainly be increased going through neighborhoods that already exist. Right. 
Uh, yeah, so I think, I think certainly from staff's perspective, you know, we, we've done quite a few traffic impact or, or, or speed studies which count speed and volume. And so again, as the gentleman talked about, I think staff is keenly aware of the, the speeding issues that, that concerns have come in in this area, Meadowhead, Mayfair, Morning Drive, Cherry Tree. Um, we've also certainly gotten those requests on Columbia. Covers Cove is another one to write the, the bolt start coming up, so we pulled up a couple of those uh, traffic calming devices. We've also done a significant number of those studies and installed speed humps uh, in Fairhaven up here. And so I think, you know, while, while staff doesn't necessarily drive it every day like the residents out there, I think we've got a fairly good handle on it. And so, you know, from staff's perspective, Country Club can accommodate the additional volume of traffic that we would anticipate here. <laughs> Please. I think, I think certainly the issue with Columbia and Covers Cove is more problematic. And again, where we tend to have folks take greater issue is not a collector that's side loaded, but rather it's where it's front loaded and particularly where it's, it's double loaded. Uh, and then the same thing, the case as traffic gets down here, you're right, there's very limited access to get back southbound. Um, and, and, and I'd say this, you know, there is, there's a future road plan. I can't tell you when it'll be, can't tell you if it'll be in my lifetime, um, but, you know, part of the comment was as we try to plan for it with the additional road in this area that goes over and connects to Homestead Park and Schwab. That's certainly a long time off, greater issue, greater development in this area using it. But yeah, I, as I said, I certainly can appreciate the concerns of the residents. That's probably the most significant concern that staff had. This project didn't necessarily cause us to say that's a reason to recommend denial, but I think certainly as we get development applications um, on the rest of the undeveloped land in the area, that's something that we will continue to look at and at some point probably does tamp down uh, zoning recommendations to, to not have them increase beyond a particular point. So fair, fair, fair concern. I'm not, I'm not standing up here saying residents are wrong. I'm right. It's not it at all. So with the plan that is already um, coming out with the two parking spaces for those units, um, Country Club Boulevard and Columbia, I foresee people parking on those two roads once there's no parking left in that apartment complex. Um, you know, and I feel like that's going to be a huge problem for residents. It's already a problem in that neighborhood with people parking on the streets that live there already. Um, and so once those people don't have anywhere to park or they have guests or they have five cars, where are they going to park? Um, so I just foresee that being a huge, huge issue. Um, also the fence that's on the back side, um, I can't fathom residents really wanting to have a fence back there when it's just been an open area back up to the golf course or putting in and two fences where they would have to walk through two fences to go from one side to the other. Um, so, you know, that's a huge issue that I, I foresee as well. Um, and just, just traffic is, is horrible over there. Um, you know, five o'clock, eight o'clock, when people go to work and they're coming home, you can't get out on 1103 or 35 without having to sit there. Um, like they said, the kids are late to school every day. Um, you know, additional 220 units and an additional possible 400 to 500 people. The infrastructure is just not there to support that. I just can't see that. I know I'm new, but I got a couple of questions and I was really patient by listening to everyone. So I wanted to say a couple of things. One, um, I'm jealous of the community love that you have for each other. You can feel it. Um, and I'm empathetic or I wouldn't be sitting here because none of us are getting paid. Um, and I did grow up in Section 8 housing myself, so I know what it feels like to live in an apartment. Um, 
and somebody said that they're not from shirts, but they got here as fast as they could, and that's what I did. Um, Miss, I think it was a Miss Samantha Goggins. If I said your name wrong, I'm sorry. Is she still here? Okay. She brought up a, a point about the schools, and so I am a school teacher now, so I get schools. Um, and um, I see Clement, excuse me, Steele is the feeder high school, is that correct? What is the feeder uh, middle school? Doby. Doby, okay. And what is, how many elementary schools do you have over there that uh, kids go to? Typically there's, there's two to three that each go to a middle school and then two middle schools to go to a high school. One, and then there's, a there's just one elementary school? Just one. Okay. Say again. Correct. I, what is there, two that they're building, or is this one, this science and technology one? Just one? If, if okay. we could, maybe, Commissioner, if you want to discuss something, speak into the microphone, please. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, because we, we need to be on the record. So any any dis I, I don't necessarily say don't talk to each other, but if you're going to do it, please we all they, we all need to hear it. So was, it, was that did you get your question answered? Um, I I just want to know how many schools there were because there was a, a point to be made about how long it took to get the kids to school and back. Um, as much as we have to look out for our elderly residents, which it seems that that's the point of many of the individuals that made here, I, my point is that we have to look out for the kids because they have no advocate. You can sit in here and advocate for yourselves, but we have to advocate for the children because they're not here. They should be asleep going to school tomorrow. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know what the, uh what the school district has planned for Northern Church, uh, Doby, if I'm not, that's the one over here on Elbel, correct? All the way down here in Cibolo? And, and yeah. Um, now, high school, you know, Steel High School, at least it's down 1103, you know, it's a little convoluted, but yeah, that just, um, anyway. Um, anything else? I, I've got some more if everybody else is done. And Go so ahead. All, are all of the units going to be sold individually or are any of them going to be homesteads for anyone? So I, I certainly can't answer that. My understanding from what the applicant has said is that the, the buildings will be sold with the four units. I have no idea whether or not they can get a homestead exemption on the part that they live in or not. I, okay. I don't know. Okay. And unfortunately, that's not really something that the city regulate yeah. well will they yeah. be owner occupied so so what i understanding is that they anticipate some of the buildings will be owned by and and one of the units will be occupied by the person that owns the building they lease others out but yeah there there probably are people who buy them don't live in any of the four units yep. that's what i understand will there will there be any airbnb or um rental arbitrage restrictions on any of those okay so, so i will i will be clear on this the city does not regulate airbnbs um so if you have a single family home that can be used as an airbnb it can be used as a pit pad yeah, i okay. understand the deed restrictions I appreciate it. I'm trying to, but just to be clear the city does not currently regulate that okay um, I had one thing for the uh, for the developer. Um, why is the primary or the the main entrance for this facility off Columbia and not off Country Club? I don't, now, you're all going to tell me, and I understand. I drove it yesterday. Country Club is in bad shape. Okay, but if it was repaired. It, as Mr. James says, there's, there's no, there are no driveways, and it would make much more sense to have these, these people coming and going on Country Club than it does to have them up on Columbia, where they have to drive through the residential neighborhood to get in and out. Now, so the driveway you have on Country Club, is that exit only, or is that a two-way, or? It's two, two-way.
my name is Luke Legrand. I'm with the development team. Um, the, my, my personal address? Uh, 1102 East Ontario Boulevard. I'm part of Keller Williams Commercial. But the entrance on Country Club Boulevard would be a resident entry exit only. No guests would be allowed to enter. The entry on Columbia would be for guests and residents. And the reason behind that is Nolly Caribbean, who owns the contiguous property back up to 35, does have future plans of bringing another road in from the access road and bringing it right to the entrance of our development. Um, it's hard to say exactly where that was going to be. Their previous location of that entry got sidelined because of where TxDOT put the entry to the park and ride. So they're working with them right now on a new location that would be further to the south that will wrap around and come right into Columbia. So that's okay. the reason of that, that main right. entry being there. Thank you. And a, a personal soapbox, if, if, if you'll bear with me for a minute. Um, we have heard, um, you know, certainly an overpass at Country Club would be a godsend, okay? Uh, you know, again, I, I remember, you know, this was back, but you had Scenic Hills, you had the original North Cliff, and you had the three streets there, Fox Bar and, and those three, and that was it up there. Uh, and you had a two-way access road. I think the worst thing Dot ever did and is turn those into one way. And why they had, you know, because you see them doing it down on Interstate 10 now. I see absolutely no reason for them to have done that, but for some reason they've got it in their head. Um, but has the city ever approached TxDOT, Brian? We have. Because here's what I see as I drive is, is, is um, I go down I-10 occasionally going down to uh, the truck stop there at Ackerman Road. And, and you get down there somewhere I don't remember exactly where it is, it's whether it's, uh, I think it's the other side of uh, 15, 16, and somewhere in there. And here they're building this huge, uh, they're elevating the interstate with, a, with an underpass, and you look on both sides and there's nothing. There, there, there's no streets to go under that overpass. What are they building that for? Well, I know, because all that empty property out there is going to develop. And then you go north on 35, and look at everything they're doing up there on the top of the New Braunfels Hill. Why are they doing that? Because there's something like a thousand or four thousand homes going in up there. So why do they sit here in their office chairs and ignore what's going on in shirts? What do we have to do to energize them? I mean, they're building for people that don't even live there yet. Understood. I would you know? certainly encourage folks to call TxDOT, the local office. I'd encourage you to call both the New Braunfels and okay. the San Antonio offices as well as the uh, Alamo Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. Thank Any you. Any support we can get for that? We yeah, no, I, I knew the answer, Brian, but I you know, know it's it. just, it, it's frustrating because they keep saying no money, no money, no money, but you look around at what's going on and you're gonna say, I thought you had no money, you know? Okay, Here's, here, here are my observations. Number one, um, I think the biggest thing that, that, that my biggest hang up with this proposed development is that row of fourplexes that backs up right to the, to uh, what is that? That's the fairways, um, okay? And I'm sorry, uh, I don't believe that this incorporated into the backyard meets ne neither the intent nor the spirit of a landscape buffer, okay? Um, if, if that whole row of fourplexes were to, were to disappear to where you had a, 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 you know, a, a decent sized buffer, maybe even these folks wouldn't object so much. Um, and, I, and, and again, I heard it several times and I agree. Um, the, the problem with this one is we're trying to, you know, you mentioned all the other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got one later if you all want to stick around where Homestead is, is um, proposing to amend their PDD to add more uh, multifamily, townhome type things. And, and I'm okay with that because it's part of the planned, you know, it's part of their development plan. What we're trying to do here is, is shove this into an existing neighborhood. Um, and, it, and, it, um, and it doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood. Uh, and, and you said it yourself, Brian, no, no one disagrees that we could use more affordable housing and shirts. And the big question is, where do we put it? Um, I don't think this is the right place. Um, now, 
All right. Anybody else have anything? Okay, well, what, uh, again, to, just to reiterate one more time, what we as the commission are tasked to do tonight is provide a recommendation to city council. City council has final say on approval or denial of this PDD. All we're going to do um, is recommend. Now, this was all, uh, uh, it, was, it was video streamed out there. Uh, it's recorded. Uh, and my experience is when something like this is on their agenda, um, most if not all of the city council members will watch this video. Um, so um, they're going to hear what you had to say, they're going to hear what we have to say, uh, they're going to hear what the developer had to say, uh, and then you guys get to do it again. Okay, um, you, you get to you get to you get to address city council, um, but so um, commissioners, what what I need, um, unless you have anything else to add, Brian, Talk to um, is 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 a motion recommending that city council either approve or deny. Um, PLPDD 2022-0095. And I will, I will remind commissioners that either it requires four, uh, four positive votes for the motion uh, to move pat to, uh, to go. So however you make the motion. Sir, you stated earlier that we can make a motion with objections where there was um, a caveat. Um, so, so you can, you can, and I think to, to supplement what, what chairperson said, you can recommend to deny, you could table it, need to think about it, need to get more information. You can recommend approval as is, or you can recommend approval with changes or conditions. Um, so those are really your options. And so the commissioner is right then, so we need to get a motion. That motion would need to get a second. For it to pass, we would need four affirmative votes. And I, as the chairman, cannot make a motion. So it's up to, and this is typical. They all rush to make, you know. <laughs> I guess I'll go first because I'm the rookie and I don't, I don't, you know, it's my first one. So um, I listened to everyone tonight. Um, I think I'm pretty smart to understand what's going on here. And I recommend that we approve, but we make a caveat that it's R6 coded. So. And that would be straight R6 zoning? Correct. All right, I have a motion to um, approve R6. Was that right? Well, I'm sorry, what'd you say? That is correct, sir. R6. No question. So earlier I thought I heard you say that uh, it being zoning for single family did not preclude them from building the uh, fourplexes they were proposing. Did I misunderstand? So, so what I, maybe I said, and I can confuse myself, is the PDD as proposed would lock them in to this layout with the fourplexes in the buildings. Um, the, the motion to go R6 as straight zoning would mean essentially they can build single family, not duplex, not multifamily. Every uh, home has to be on its own individual lot. Those lots have to meet the size dimension, 7,200 square feet in the UDC and meet the setbacks and things like that as well. So that, that's what that would be. So it would be a radically different proposal. Again, I think more like what you see to the north or south uh, with, with the adjacent neighborhoods. Thank you. All right, so I have a motion to recommend approval of R6 zoning from Commissioner Carbon, do I have a second? Second. And I have a second from Commissioner Brown. Okay, any discussion on the motion? Yes. Go ahead. So 
So what <clears throat> what we'd be voting on would be adoption of this PDD with the exception that it be R zoned R6. The, the way I would characterize it as staff understands the motion is you would be voting on rezoning this property to R6 as straight zoning. PDD goes away, straight R6 zoning. All right. Anyone have any comments? I will tell you, I, I think it's a mistake um, to recommend, we've done it before, where we've recommended alternative zoning to city council, but I think straight zoning on anything uh, is probably a mistake. Um, because, uh, again, uh, a PDD uh, gives both, it gives the developer some flexibility, but on the same token, it gives the city some flexibility to where, you know, sometimes we end up with a better, um, a better layout, a better plan than we do if we just go straight R6. And um, there are some caveats, uh, you know, council just uh, a month or so ago, um, there are some limitations that go with R6. You can only do, uh, I think this is a small enough piece of property. I don't think it'll apply, but. Um, um, this, would, this would fit, it, and in talking to the applicant and you know, try to find that balance, sometimes kind of see where they are, not that you have to do what they want, but as to delay work a PDD with R6, I think the applicant would prefer, you know, you just make a recommendation, move it on. Um, they don't have a preference to do a PDD for R6 than they do straight R6 zoning uh, kind of going forward. So um, to, to the commissioner's point, I think they understand some of the disadvantages of straight zoning and, and don't want to delay it to do a PDD with an R6 space. Um, uh, again, I had a little trouble hearing you. Oh, uh, sorry. What, what was his comment about So, the So I went over to ask the applicant again, just not that you have to do what he says, but just so the applicant's kind of preference is made. And, and the question was, you know, there's some disadvantages, possible advantages to going with a PDD of R6. And so I wanted to ask the applicant, would that be preferable or are you six one half does the other if you're going to go R6, go straight zoning? His indication was if you feel R6 is appropriate, then just go with the straight zoning recommendation and move it on. Doesn't have a preference that you work out a PDD with R6. All right, so the, 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 the motion, as I understand it, is to recommend approval of straight R6 zoning rather than a PDD. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? And we can look at other options if you don't like this one, okay? But if there's no further discussion, now, I'll let it go, but the vote will, will come down this way and skip down to you, John, and come back this way. Okay, that's, that's the way we do it. I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't get to you early enough. All right, one more opportunity. Any discussion? Any more comments? Call for the vote. Aye. Nay. Aye. 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 Nay. So if I counted right, that's uh, four in favor and two opposed. Yes, that's four in favor, two opposed. So the motion passes. So again, just so folks understand, the recommendation coming out of the Planning Zoning Commission is for straight R6 zoning. We anticipate the application going to City Council on September 27th, the week of my birthday. I know everybody's excited about that. Um, it's not on my birthday. I wouldn't mind spending time with everybody then, but um, just to be clear, and if folks, I, I want to make this really clear, the recommendation that the applicant is asking for is still the PDD with the multifamily, okay? So the applicant is still going forward at council, and they're going to get up at council and say, we know what PNZ did, we want the thing that we asked for. The council will have in the staff report that PNZ thinks the most appropriate use and zoning for the property is the R6. So again, when I said earlier, you need to show up at council, you need to show back up at council. So thank you guys very much, and we'll go out front and can chat with you guys and answer questions.
really, really. Okay. Mine's at 27. Okay. Well, mine's not the mine's at 30. Um, a couple of days away. Why don't we uh, hang on just a second, sir? Why don't we take a, a, a 10 minute break here, guys? That'll be okay. Dan, okay if we do 10, take a break? Okay. We're going to uh, recess for 10 minutes.
All right, we'll call this meeting back to order at uh, 9.51 p.m. And uh, we'll move on to item 5B. Another public hearing, PLPDD 2022-0054, request to rezone approximately 20 acres of land to plan development district. The property is a portion of parcel ID 67955, approximately 4.2 acres of land, generally located southeast of Archer Pass and Winkler Trail. A portion of parcel ID 67955, approximately 4.5 acres of land, generally located 1,100 feet southwest of Archer Pass and Winkler Trail. And a portion of parcel ID 112888, approximately 11 acres of land, generally located 2,900 feet southeast of the intersection of Homestead Parkway and Hartley Square, City of Shirts, Guadalupe County, Texas. Megan. Good evening, Commission. This is for PLPDD 2022-0054, Homestead Subdivision Plan Development District, Megan Harrison Planner. So here are the properties. So there are three, so please keep that in mind. Um, so the first one is what is known right now as uh, Unit 18. Um, it is approximately, directly from the intersection of Archer Pass and Winkler Trail. The next one is what is known as Unit 7B. Um, it is about 1,100 feet from Archer Pass and Winkler Trail. And then the last unit, Unit 13, um, which is directly 2,900 feet southeast. So we kind of did it this way because you have to think this area is not developed yet. Um, so it is from 2,900 feet from Hartley Square and Homestead Parkway. Um, it is also adjacent to Green Valley Road. So here is the public hearing notice map. There were five public hearing notices sent out on August 12, 2022. Um, we have received one response opposed to the uh, proposed development. Other than that, we have not received um, any others. I was gonna say, you need to give them a reference. They're new. They don't know where this subdivision is at. So home- Give a known point. The community that we were just talking about, Homestead subdivision is directly the, to the east of uh, that subdivision, but here is I-35, Quick Trip, Schwab Road, that's kind of the area. Thank you. No problem. So here's the current land use map. Um, so again, this is an existing plan development district. So Homestead um, is an existing PDD. They are just coming in now to essentially rezone three of these properties, uh, but they are zone, or excuse me, they are, uh, have the land use designation of single family residential. So here is the current zoning map. As you can see, it is that purple color for the plan development district. And then just wanted to kind of, so there's three zoning exhibits just due to them being separate. So the first one is unit 7B. Currently it is the land use of uh, multifamily, or excuse me, uh, townhome. And so this one is requesting to be townhome slash multifamily. This is unit 13. It is existing as uh, the townhome, but they are requesting to do townhome multifamily. And then this is unit 18, which is existing as commercial, but they are requesting to go to that townhome multifamily. So all in all, they make up a, about a 20 acre development um, in the overall subdivision for Homestead. So the townhome multifamily is the 100 by 100. They are going to be having a 25 foot front, 10 foot side and 10 foot rear. So as kind of discussed, um, you know, there was a subcommittee meetings. I know some of you that are new on the PNZ, there were subcommittee meetings that had three PNZ members and three city council members, and those were held uh, last year as well as the beginning. There was one this year. So Homestead overall itself has a mixture of single family residential, townhome, multifamily, uh, kind of throughout the area, as well as commercial, but that's kind of more along the front of 35. Open space parks, overall the Homestead subdivision is going to be providing approximately 60 acres of open space, kind of again, that's throughout the entire Homestead subdivision, so not just in this one area, but as the master plan itself. That doesn't account for the small lots kind of in the subdivision, um, in the units, doesn't account for the landscaping along the Homestead Parkway. 
They are also, uh, another big key thing for the subcommittee was maintaining those 10 foot side yard setbacks and they are going to be maintaining that. So the PDD is consistent uh, with City Council's vision for having a mixture of housing types. It is in conformance with the comprehensive land use plan having a mixture of residential options. So staff is recommending approval of the proposed zone change to plan development district. And then the developer is here as well to give a presentation commission. All right, thank you, Megan. Commissioners, hi, my name is Matt Matthews. I'm with Freehold Communities, the developer of Homestead, and uh, thank you for hearing this PDD amendment request tonight. Um, let's see here. That's not what I wanted to do. Just to kind of give you an overview of, of the subdivision and where we are right now, uh, Freehold Communities owns the residential portion of the Homestead project within the city of Schertz. This uh, commercial multifamily on the frontage here off of 35 is a separate owner. It's the, the owner of the property that we bought, uh, bought our residential portion from. And right now in the subdivision, uh, 356 lots have been developed and platted. And we're in the process right now of developing 331 lots uh, right here. This is 100 lots here, uh, 128 lots here up in units 7 and 10 and 103 75-foot wide lots down here. And again, as Megan outlined, what we're, we're doing here today or asking for is uh, some flexibility in the existing zoning for units 13 and 7B, which are existing, uh, currently exist as townhome, and trying to get a little more flexibility in the planning of those units with the townhome multifamily designation. Unit 18 is a commercial, this is, this is a commercial unit that uh, with the future of Schwab Road somewhat unknown, uh, we thought that was a more compatible use for the subdivision to, to bring in some of this uh, alternative uh, product and, and replace that commercial, which isn't really viable, and put some home product there. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a blow up of what the, uh, each unit will look like. This is uh, 128 units here uh, on unit, I guess it's 13. And uh, these are the two units here, uh, not comprised of 91 units. Uh, roughly, the, the product mix, uh, it's all, it's all two-car garage product. Uh, Three-quarter, or about two-thirds of the units are uh, three-bedroom and 1,565 square feet, and the other third, one-bedroom, 1,180 square feet. Uh, this, this is, I know this is a little bit hard to see here, but this is, this kind of shows you the garage, two-car garage on the, on the ground floor here and uh, how the living space kind of works out. And this is, this is a conceptual stage right now, of course, where we need to get through the zoning before we get through the, the detailed planning part of it. But it will be consistent, you know, the, the elevations of this product, uh, we have some pretty uh, detailed architectural restrictions that we impose on our home builders in the community, and we're going to apply those same architectural standards to this product, uh, and, and we, we want to keep a consistency throughout the community that we've worked hard to achieve out there, and the, the same thing we're going to impose on this townhome product. So, and again, this is just to, to try to provide some different product out here. You know, the, the 1,565 square feet's not much smaller the, the two-thirds of the units that we're proposing, not much smaller than some of our smaller single-family detached product. Uh, and then providing to a third of the units, uh, you know, as, as a two-bedroom, smaller, a little bit smaller than the single-family offers there to provide a diversity in product. I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you. This is a public hearing. So uh, at this time, I'll open for public input. Anyone wish to address the council or the commission on this uh, topic? No? All righty. Close the public input and commissioners, comments, questions? Uh, yes, I had one question. So how many, uh, how many different home builders do you anticipate allowing to build in this community? For, for this particular use here? Yes. We'll probably have one builder. This, this is going to be a consistent, you know, constructor here. We won't, we won't have a, it's, it's connected, you know, it's a series of two, three, four, five, and six plex buildings. 
and we'll, we'll, we'll contract with one builder to build this product. It won't be a mixed mash of builders um, for this. Okay, and they'll all be townhomes, individually owned? All townhomes, potentially, I mean, there's, there's, that's unknown at this point. Uh, it's it's going to be in a condo regime to get this kind of a, a layout. Uh, we're going to need to probably put this into a condo regime, and these won't be single family, you know, or individual lots. Again, it'll be in a condo. Okay, okay, thanks. Anyone else? John? Sir, when do you expect this to be completed? This, uh, we're getting, we're, right now we're working on the infrastructure to serve. These have been graded. Uh, we've got to go through a process, a site planning process, develop the product, uh, develop horizontal site improvements. So this, this would probably wouldn't be vertical until, you know, I think our best guess right now is, is uh, third quarter of 2023 after we design all the plans and we go vertical. And then, of course, with, with building cycles right now, uh, you wouldn't see anything up for months after that. Four, <laughs> four months, I wish, yeah. Um, so my understanding, you're, you're, rather than um, condos, townhomes, my, my understanding of a condominium complex is, ba is basically um, you have the the association that is responsible for all the exterior, correct, and that, and that's what your that's correct kind of the concept you have in mind. Um, I'm I'm a little concerned about the the ten foot rear setback. Um, could you bring your concept um, Because I think the only place I saw him was right here on this one. Um, ten foot. I'm sorry. I want to make sure I get to the unit. Or a lot of the a lot of these units back up to open space. We have a drainage uh, channel well, that runs through the project, so we're a little closer to the rear yard line. If you look back at the at the overall here, uh, let me get back on that. This is a drainage course, so a trail system there, uh, and so some of those 10 foot, you know, rear setbacks are adjacent to, you know, large swaths of open space here. Okay, and, and that's kind of what I saw. I just, I just wanted to, to take a second look at it. It's, um, uh, you're not really backing up against existing developable single family or any future single homes. Family. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, and of course, the difference here, uh, you know, if you if you uh, want to compare this one to the one we just uh, we just discussed for two hours and some, um, you'll you'll see that um, you know none of these are backing up on on the single family homes. You know that now they may be across the street, but. You know, you're not, they're not sharing back fences and things like that. So, um, and this is part of their master plan, if you will, rather than trying to uh, come back later. Yes, sir. And, these, and this has been represented in all our marketing materials since the beginning. Mm -hmm. These gray areas here are the lots that we're developing. Yeah. So any new resident would understand that, that this was proposed if this change is approved. Yeah. Um, just disappointed to hear that there may be some issues with uh, Schwab Road. That's uh, it's just you know, what, what happens between here and 35. Yeah. I shouldn't speak to that. There's another owner here. Understand? Uh, it's it's a tough road. No, I get you. Just you know, as the as a 20-year fire marshal, I always look at these things, and I'm I'm really looking at ingress and egress. And Schwab Road was really going to be nice, but I understand the the issues. Okay, Commissioner, uh, anybody have anything else? Yeah, the, there's another contrast between this one and the first one we were talking about a little earlier. There's no houses out there at the moment. They're grading and putting in utilities. So the people that do move out there, they're going to they're gonna well know that there's going to be multifamily here, so they'll have their choice. Do they want to live close to multifamily or not, as opposed to the folks in, in the, uh, the golf course area? Right. 
All right, so once again, um, our task this evening is to make a recommendation to City Council to either approve, deny, or as Mr. James points out, we can recommend approval with modifications for, uh, boy, I hate this new numbering system, really? PLPDD 2022-0054, so I need a, a motion um, for, a rec what, what, for a recommendation to City Council. Mr. Chair, reference PLPDD 2022-0054, I recommend that I make a motion that we recommend to City Council approving this uh, PDD as presented. I have a motion to approve as presented from Commissioner Broad. Do I have a second? I second the motion. All right, I'll always take the uh, uh, Commissioner Hector. I did. Because I'm still having that first name, last name issue. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have, a, I, I have a motion and a second to recommend approval as presented on PLPDD 2022-0054 to City Council. Any further discussion? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 All right. Six ayes, none opposed. That motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Um, 5C, another public hearing. Hold a public hearing, consider make a, uh, let's see, PLUDC 2022-0135. Hold a public hearing, consider and make a recommendation on amendments of Part 3, Shirts Code of Ordinances, Unified Development Code, Article 5, Section 21.5.11, Specific Use Permit, Article 9, Section 21.9.7, Landscaping, and Article 10, Section 21.10.4, Schedule of All-Street Parking Requirements. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Linda Delgado, Senior Planner. Um, unfortunately, Brian is actually kind of the mastermind of these three UDC amendments, and he wanted to give the presentation. So he is asking if we can have the public hearing, but actually table the discussion, going through the staff presentation, and we'll bring it back on the next PNZ meeting. But since it was listed on the agenda as a public hearing, we do have to open and close, let anybody that wants to see. I think most of us would go along with that and get rid of the, re <laughs> and get rid of the rest of the agenda to the next whatever meeting also. So I think we should handle this one. Make the, Separately, I understand. Decide, decide to table this one if that's the, what the commission decides. And then um, due to the state law for the next item, we really should move the plot forward tonight. Okay, so um, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the, uh, the meeting for public comment. Anyone want to address the commission? Okay, public input is closed. All right, so the, the, the suggestion was that we table this to our next meeting. So Dan, I need what, a motion to table? Is it table or postpone, what is it? What's the? Yeah, it's actually a motion postpone. Postpone, okay. Mr. Chairman, reference PLUDC 2022-0135. Uh, I move that we postpone this matter until a date accepted by the city staff. All right, I have a motion to uh, postpone. Do I have a second? A second. And a second from Ms. Brown. Any further questions or comments? Discussion? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes, none opposed. That motion, so we'll hear this one at the uh, at our next meeting, I assume. All right. Uh, item six, six A. Items for individual consideration. Are you okay with taking six, seven, eight, nine, and no. All at once? No. I don't I don't want to do that. Why? Six A is an internal one. So I, I have to give the presentation for the uh, building hope replat. I, I think we can right. get through that one pretty easy. Yeah. 
I, so I can keep it short. 6A. PLRP 2022-0129, consider and act upon a request for approval of a replat of the Building Hope Charter School subdivision Lot 1, Block 1, to create Lot 2 and Lot 3, Block 1, an approximate 11.2 acre tract of land located southwest of the intersection of IH-35 and Fairlawn Avenue, City of Shirts, Kamau, and Guadalupe County, Texas. Good evening, Commission. PLRP 2022-0129, Building Hope Charter School subdivision replat. So here is the property outlined in green, I-35 Fairlawn Avenue. This is the existing School of Science Technology. So this is the current lot one, block one. They are requesting to replat. So they are um, proposing to, or excuse me, they are uh, having the lot line moved down a little bit for lot one. Um, and then they are going to combine this to be one lot. You'll see it on the plat exhibit as I go to the next slide. So again, this is the existing lot one, block one. It was a final plat that was approved um, in 2020 by the PNZ and recorded in the county in 2021. So this is the uh, portion to the uh, west of the property that is going through the replat to make kind of that L shape. And then this is just showing that bottom of the L as well as the uh, top one. So this would be taking the lot one, block one of the Building Hope to create lot two and lot three, block one of the Building Hope Charter School. It was reviewed by the uh, Engineering, Planning, Public Works and Fire Department with no objections. They are also providing a uh, right dedication for the Master Thoroughfare Plan Roadway, the residential collector that runs at the southern portion of the property that they are calling as Technology Avenue. And that is all that I have. All right, thank you. Commissioners, any questions or comments? Uh, this one is up for our action. So uh, I, um, I need a motion to um, approve or deny the uh, replat, PLRP 2022-0129. Mr. Chairman, reference case PLUDC 2022-0135 uh, replat, uh, make a motion. Mr. Rowe, that's you. the wrong number. My apologies. Wait, where am I? I wasn't, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. You're on 6A. I hate these things. It, it, the last four is 0129. I got it. Sorry. Reference uh, case PLRP 2022-0129. For a replat, I recommend that we approve it as presented. I have a second? Second. All right, and a second from Commissioner Hector. Any further discussion? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes, none opposed. Okay, real quick, item 7A, request by commissioners. Anybody want anything on the agenda? Any announcements? Um, I'll make one real quick. If, uh, if uh, you may not be aware, uh, Commissioner uh, Gordon Ray uh, had an accident and he's uh, uh, injured both his, uh, both his feet, so he's kind of immobile for a little while. He's, uh, he's at home and uh, hopes to be able to make our next meeting, but uh, if any of you want to give him a call, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Uh, any announcements by city staff? Quick. So the first one is the uh, Maskey Soccer Field Site Plan Amendment. So it is for off of 75 Maskey, so Maskey Road, FM 1518, Shirts Parkway. It is for a new ground storage tank. Um, so it did come to the city staff and was approved in, on August 11th. Next one is the Corbett lift station. That is also a new ground storage tank off of Ray Corbett Drive, FM 1518, Shaper Road area. And then the last one is the Learning Experience Revolution Church Lot 2 site plan. Uh, this is on 399 and Wiederstein Road for a 10,000 square foot building. And then I have two super quick. This morning you probably received an email from Tiffany about the APA Texas Conference in El Paso. It's October 19th to the 21st. We are asking if you would like to attend that conference that you let Tiffany know by September 5th. She's going to hand out some um, little pamphlets after the meeting with some of the information. And then the other thing is I know you all probably saw um, I made a City View presentation a while back to City Council. I will be bringing that presentation. Just didn't think tonight was the best night for that. So at the next meeting, we'll have a city view presentation and explain the new software to y'all. All right, thank you. 
So item eight is information that's uh, in your packet, just an update on uh, where our projects are with city council. And there be no further business for this commission. This meeting's adjourned.